demand seems to be recovering too fast for supply to catch up. There is a case for the ECB to hike into a recession, of course. Yes, it has to do some and make some fairly painful and unpalatable decisions when we are undergoing a slowdown. We're calling next year rolling recessions in the global economy. We are getting closer to that point where the Fed can decelerate its pace of hikes, but we're not there yet. Everyone here is making it up as they go because we really have not been in this position for so many decades. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brown, with I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down six tenths of 1% on the S&P. TK, Amazon tanking and Apple just about holding on. Well, there we are with the text of the morning. And what it is, John, is this is Accounting 302 Friday. It's not about basic accounting, which I was lousy at. I don't know about you. This is more advanced, and it's about FX. If you take out the FX adjustments, guess what? It really really wasn't all that bad, particularly at Apple. Can you tell Amazon investors that too? Because that stock is down 13 percent. Down 13 was down, I believe, 20 percent earlier. You go you, you go into their report, and the international is a perfect example. Sales at international were up a buoyant 12 percent, but after FX, they get slammed negative 5 percent. Lisa, you're fantastic at this. What surprised you most? The numbers themselves in the earnings or the way the markets responded to them? Well, the fact that you suddenly got a massive $150 billion decline in the market value of one company just overnight, bam, done. I mean, how much is just the magnitude of the moves really what comes out at a time when we've already baked in so much bad news if you look at where the Nasdaq's been? However, it's not just about what's in the earnings for this quarter. The forward look is gloomy. Even for Apple, it's pretty gloomy. And for Amazon, it's really gloomy. Exactly. Was and this their worst forecast for the holiday quarter ever? Ever. And this is what we're seeing. You know, Meta also with many different quarters of declining uh, user uh, user base. How much can you actually see this before you have to change Fang to Ang and then Ag? And ag. ag. I think and it's Ag. Ah. I think it's just is Ag. It just Ah now. Yeah, I think it might be just Ag. I don't agree with any of this. I like what the sell side did overnight. They knocked down ten dollars. Hey, can we just have a little bit? No, of a light I don't. Moment. I don't agree <laughs> with the gloom on just, just a light Look, moment. First That's of all, all, don't bundle them together. Don't put Meta with Amazon. Meta is a train wreck. But the bottom line is the sell side looked at this. They brought down their price targets a little bit, but there's an enthusiasm if you look out beyond the legitimate gloom Lisa's talking about. Are you does giving... the Fed focus does the Fed filter into this analysis? Okay. Are you giving the sell side credit? Because I took a snapshot of the A and R screen last night before it changed this morning. One sell on Amazon before these numbers, Tom, fifty five buys, two holds. Yeah. You're giving them credit this morning. Well, when you look at AWS, uh, that's what they're buying. And Anurag Ron is leading the way, frankly, on Amazon optimism. But what this comes down to is strong dollar. Can you imagine if President Trump was president right now? He'd be out there screaming about effect of strong dollar. And the CFO of Apple last night was screaming about effect of strong dollar, 480 basis points next quarter. And Corona would be saying, tell me more, because Dolly Yen right now is back to 147, Tom. Dolly Yen breaking out yeah. by 9 tenths of 1%. Nice data check there. Let's talk about hot inflation in Europe as well. Let's whip through the price action for you. Equities look like this on the S&P 500. Negative on the S&P. We are down lower by around about six tenths of one percent. Where are we? We're down by six tenths of one percent nice on the S&P. Nice analysis there. Thank you, Tom. Yields up by nine basis points on a 10-year, just north of 4% on a 10-year yield. In the FX market, euro dollar 99.50. TK, German inflation comes out yeah. in about two <clears throat> hours' time. And based on the regional figures so far, that is going to be ugly, ugly, ugly. And it goes to the headlines yesterday from Lagarde, and I'm going to mention what I mentioned yesterday. They need data. They're incredibly data-dependent. And what you did not see yesterday was a calendar structure for ECB because they don't know what those inflation numbers are going to be out one meeting, two meetings, three meetings. It's I never thought mystery. that um, Fang would trigger you that much. But no, I just really think... get you going? I, look, I, I, John, full disclosure, I've studied equipment leasing five times. Sure. Five times I've gone down in flames. This stuff is hard. You've got to go beneath the headline data, as the CFOs did yesterday, and adjust for the shockingly strong dollar. And when you do that, it's it's um, the FT had a, a summary here that I believe it was Apple. I, I, if I'm wrong on that, folks, don't get angry. Where the FX adjustment of Apple yesterday was sure. bigger than Nike's profits. Can I just tell you, the only person getting angry here this morning is you. No, I just no, no I just think the analysis the is stuff. the gloom is off the mark on some of these tech companies. Okay, we can talk about that through the hour. Bramo, the gloom is off the mark. Well. 
it is for some of them, but not others, which is why it's ag. It's not fang. Anyway, we'll get into that. Or perhaps we'll just keep triggering it. All right, 8.30 a.m. This is actually really important. <laughs> the last slew of really key data points before the election. And that is really how I'm going to cast this ahead of the Fed meeting uh, next week and then the election after that in the U.S. Such a tenuous time. U.S. Employment Cost Index for the third quarter may be one of the most important data aspects that we see. Because if you see a reacceleration of wages, of the cost of getting people in the door to work for you, that is going to make it very difficult for the Fed to do a step down or any kind of pivot. I'm going to just trigger you guys nonstop this morning. We also get personal income and spending for September at 8.30. At 10 a.m., we get University of Michigan sentiment survey for the month of October. Again, the importance of this is how are people feeling ahead of the election? Are they getting more gloomy because of some of the earnings and also just because <coughs> you are seeing gas prices go back up? I hate to use this as sort of a bellwether of whether people feel good or bad, but that seems to really correlate pretty directly with the University of Michigan sentiment survey and earnings do continue today throughout the day Chevron and Exxon before market will be getting Chevron perhaps in the next uh, half hour or so how much do we really see a sense of pushback of restraint with respect to share buybacks with respect to what they invest in given some of the political pressure we're hearing from Mike Worth uh, Chevron CEO and Scott Sheffield of Pioneer today throughout the morning on Bloomberg television John this really is a political moment, especially when the Republicans are coming out doing an investigation of the Democrats in terms of their use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and a question of how to incentivize some of these players to invest for the long term while also saying that their model should be obsolete. What do we call it, this Strategic Midterm Reserve, Tom? Or was it the Midterm Petroleum Reserve? Which one is it? It's one or the other. Strategic Political Reserve. That's which the is one. what it's become. Nice. It makes what Bill Clinton uh, uh, did look like a walk in the park. I, I don't thank get you. it. I just don't get it. Can I point out that the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, EU index, after Lagarde sure. deteriorated yesterday and became more restricted? You know, some people thought that was a really dovish Jeez, meeting. Please. It wasn't that hawkish. You know, that was the pushback yesterday after the rally in the bond market we saw. I tell you, it's unwinding this morning in a big way in the bond market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm looking at the foreign exchange. It's down ever so slightly, you know. Sure. I, uh, to your point, German inflation in what, less than two hours? Looking forward to that. Tony's with us. Tony Dwyer. Anthony Dwyer. Joins us now, Chief Market Strategist at Canaccord Generity. I think you like going by Tony, don't you? So we're going to stick with that, Tony. Tony, uh, walk I us through what you think that. of these earnings this morning, buddy. What do you think? Um, so the earnings... Obviously, it's FX. Somehow that's a shock, given what the dollar has done. However, it, it's going to be a continued influence. The, the big issue here, guys, is and, and it's really a mess. The Fed is raising rates into a his, in a historic way into a generationally levered system based on debt to GDP. Inventories have spiked and demand is, is weak. That is not the formula for, wow, let's go out and buy stocks because it's about to get good. I look, Tony, at how the Fed influences these earnings. What does what do companies do in performance, whether it's Caterpillar plus plus yesterday or Google maybe minus plus minus whatever yesterday? How do they respond to a Fed that finally blinks? Well, I, I'm not sure what a Fed that blinks means, Tom. So, for example, let, let's talk about the pivot. <clears throat> now, and a pivot is a good excuse for an oversold rally. We're currently, our call has been, as you know, this year that we'd have a tumultuous first half, followed by a summer rally, and then we called it the fall fall, which is what we talked about last time I was on the show. And now we're in the year-end rally. The year-end rally is the sweet spot where... Um, good news is, or bad news has become good news. Remember, up until now, it's pretty much a valuation Fed driven decline where it's, you know, good news is bad news because it means a tougher Fed. Now we're in this little sweet spot here going into year end where bad news is good news because it means the Fed, to your point, I might pivot a little bit. But ultimately, you go into a bad news is bad news when you have a recession. So the tech stocks that are all getting so smoked, they're, it's not like they were at a 52 week high last week. They were already down. So the yeah. risk isn't to me. It, it's not like this is new news. It's just the realization of what happens when the Fed shuts it down in a levered system. Everybody wants to channel their inner Volcker. You better be careful you get what you wish for in a levered system. Yeah, well, Tony, and this is the reason why there's this push-pull right now in markets where you see tech being punished, and yet the indexes uh, and the Dow outperforming because it is not necessarily market weight, and that's part of the issue, right, that we've seen. How much is this instructive of what's to come? Because we are seeing people suggest that perhaps the Fed will do a step down, won't raise rates as much. Is that good news, or are people just ignoring the earnings? 
I, I don't think they're ignoring the earnings, Lisa. I think they're beginning to come to the realization of the earnings, and it's going to happen a little bit more slowly. Right now, the industrials and some of the economically sensitive areas that benefit from oil and metals, um, they're they're benefiting and they're they're holding things up a little bit. Just to give you an idea, guys, up until about a week ago, the top 10 stocks, most mostly FANG, the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 accounted for 30% of the overall market index capitalization. You've got to go back to the early 70s, 1972, 73, 74, during the nifty 50 to get anywhere close to that. It's well above where it was in OO. So what you've done is, it's not that you've broken the back of tech. I th you don't need me to tell you that. Um, what you've done is you've broken the back of the top 10 stocks, which means you're going to have them drift down. And to Lisa's point, if one were to be bullish, listen, we're down 24, 25%. Now it's not the time to to go screaming short, right? But it, I I don't think it's time to buy until we get the realization of the earnings picture. And when it is time to buy, I think it's the equal weighted S and P over the market cap weighted S and P because the top the such a big influence on these stocks. It's now about twenty eight percent of the S&P 500. Seen that the last few days, haven't we, Tony? The outperformance there. Good to catch up, sir. As always, Tony Dwyer of Canaccord. Gains on Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday on the equal weight S&P, Tom. Do you know what's really weird this morning? Yeah. Do a GIP of Twitter and just to see it read on the Bloomberg <laughs> acquired by a private investor. I have to admit, I, even, I, even yeah. a couple of weeks ago, yeah. I never thought I'd see the day. And, and here we are, Tom. Yeah, we, and you're right. We've all been prepared for this. Everybody's been briefed on it, but still, oh. Yeah, at least it's in our latest reporting that Musk is said to take the CEO yeah, role. Yeah, he's chief twit. You said the bird. He said that himself, right? <laughs> he's chief twit. That's what he is. And he comes in with chief, steak and he said the bird moved is in. free. The yeah, well, how much is that Donald Trump? We can speak about that. We're going to talk about that a lot, aren't we? Are Coming we? up, Kenny Kaminsky. No, probably not. <laughs> about for Simplex in the next hour from New York. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. New up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Elon Musk begun putting his stamp on Twitter. The world's richest person closed his $44 billion takeover on the platform and has begun firing its major executives. Bloomberg's learned Musk plans to assume the role of CEO. He also plans to do away with permanent bans on users, a category that includes former President Trump. Hopes that all the Eurozone can stave off a recession got a boost today. Germany defied expectations by reporting another quarter of economic growth the country's gross domestic product rose by three-tenths of one percent in the third quarter, but momentum slowed in both France and Spain. French growth went from one-half of one percent to two-tenths of a percent. In Spain, GDP rose a worse-than-expected two-tenths of one percent. Bank of Japan is standing by its ultra-low interest rates. The central bank left its negative rate. Ten-year yield cap and asset purchases unchanged today. The BOJ continues to predict inflation will fall below 2% next year. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced around $200 billion in new spending to boost growth and ease the impact of rising prices. And Amazon has shocked Wall Street by predicting the slowest holiday quarter growth in the company's history. It says sales during the current period will rise just 2 to 8% as shoppers reduced their spending in the face of economic uncertainty, shares of Amazon were down by double-digit percentage in pre-market trading. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. season is here. The earnings are starting to pour in. The numbers are holding up better than expected. Sorry, business isn't all that bad. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Netflix earnings going across the wire. A big beat. The stock is up more than 8%. Coming in stronger than their rivals. With exclusive expert analysis. Finally back to growth. The mother of all opportunities. What is the industry to watch? That's where the rubber hits the road for Goldman Sachs. It's going to be a really interesting earnings season. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. The global economy, as you say, Tom, is looking very soft at the moment. In aggregate, our projection is 2% uh, global growth. We're calling next year uh, rolling recessions in the global economy. 
uh, uh, we're going to see various countries turn down. That was Nathan Sheets of City. What time do you think the president wakes up? I feel like I should whisper the numbers from Chevron, just in case he hears them, Tom. EPS, 556. The estimate, 494. I'm not going to whisper them. Chevron. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> blowing past forecast this morning. The second highest profit ever, ever. Let me go through these numbers. Upstream earnings, $9.31 billion. The estimate, 8.13. Downstream earnings, $2.53 <laughs> billion. The estimate, $1.95 billion. Cash flow from operations, $15.3 billion. The stock, Lisa, I think the stock this year is already up more than 50%. It's up another 2.3 in the pre market. Yeah, just to put this into perspective, its profit is up 84% from the year earlier period. Who does that at a time where you're going into a downturn? It's the oil majors. And to your point, what is the political response to this, given that they're saying, please put your profits into the ground, put your profits into producing more, put your profits back yeah. into lowering prices? And how much can they really yeah. buy back shares in that environment? PE multiple and Apple 22 ish looking forward, Chevron 10 ish. A little bit of a divide there, to say, you think? say uh, the least as well. So a lot of the people we talked to, folks, making clear we're not in the middle of, you know, do the baseball thing with the World Series starting early innings for an energy uh, success, particularly if the war in Ukraine uh, moves forward in a constructive way. Right now, we move forward on the war in tech with Anurag Rana, truly excellent with Bloomberg Intelligence with a deserved world reputation. And Rob, we've got like a one-hour interview here. We're going to squeeze it in. I'm going to do FX. You and I were weaned on textbooks of an FX effect of 3 to 4%. We're clearly seeing an FX effect of 8, 9, dare I say 10% plus. How should investors adjust to that? Is it a one-off or will there be dollar persistency? So one of the things we have always looked at in the last you know, seven, eight years is growth in constant currencies. We look at a region and we see how did the companies do in that particular region. But to be very honest, when it goes to this level of 10%, it has a second derivative impact in our view. This is when enterprises, as well as consumers in different countries, start to look at their purchasing power and say, do really have the ability to buy that product that was initially benchmarked in dollars. I think, you know, Apple, for example, is raising prices of their products in Japan and other parts of the, right. the world. The consumers really need to think whether they can buy those products down the road. Does Amazon, with the challenges of the cloud, which you're arguably a world expert on, do they fix the cardboard box business by making it more profitable, by simply raising prices in the traditional Amazon world? So Amazon, Amazon does have a near-term problem because you just can't turn the, the box business around that quickly. Now, the slowdown in the cloud is not a big, uh, I would say, prediction because one would have expected that. So, but the issue over here is that slowdown came with a fall in profit because the cost of cloud is going up because of higher energy costs, uh, costs and wage inflation. Uh, we saw that during the pandemic, the, the, the growth rates did dip quite a bit in the cloud business, but at that time, the costs were not rising. So this is really bad for everything cloud at this point, but more so on the cost side of it, not just on just uh, on the sales also. Anurag, people had already brought back their expectations quite considerably. Are you surprised that even with that, the disappointments were so severe as to eradicate $100 billion off the market value of the likes of Amazon? So, Lisa, I would say that, uh, I mean, even I had built in my own expectations of a slowdown, I mean, let's say for Microsoft and, and Amazon. But frankly speaking, I was also disappointed by the degree of it. Now, that means that there is just a certain still standstill of certain businesses that are not operating at that same level that they were. I mean, imagine for a company like Microsoft that has been growing in, you know, 15, 16 percent, it's only going to grow 8 to 9 percent next quarter in constant currency. Um, I mean, that's a that's a big drop, frankly. So what do you think going forward, Anurag? Are we watching the deflation of the tech bubble, and is it almost all the way done, or does it have more to go where we don't necessarily see the metas of the world in the same kind of circumstance? Amazon has to focus more on cloud and stripping back some of the hiring that they've done, and Apple is sort of a, to a toss-up between a luxury company and one that is a staple. Yeah. So one of the things I would say is at least for the next two to three quarters, you do expect growth rates to slow down. Now, it's very tough to say at what part of that is already priced in the stock, and I think we'll find out over the next three, 
three to four quarters. But really, I would say is the, the, the real kicker for us is the year after. I think all of the demand that we are losing right now comes back and comes back very strong. And the reason why we are confident about this is because the end markets are so large. And second, we actually saw the same thing during the pandemic is for these even these high cloud businesses, the growth rates actually improved after the pandemic when we uh, saw the resurgence in economic activity. So, you know, frankly speaking, it's just a matter of a few quarters. You know, after that, we think uh, tech bounces back and bounces back very strongly. Anurag, wonderful to hear from you, sir. As always, one of the best. Anurag Rana there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Dan Ives of Wedbush making a move, Tom, cutting the price target of 200 yeah. on Apple, down from 220. Yeah, I mentioned they move, you know, they move $10, $100, whatever, excuse me, $20, whatever it is. That's still up 35%-ish out a year. I mean, I mean, these price targets uh, are a constructive set of new lower price targets led by the, uh, I think I can say either the Uber bull or the Lyft bull, Dan Ives. The average 12-month price target, Bramo, based on my screen on the Bloomberg right now, still about 180 for Apple. Well, and Apple has been the stalwart, right? I mean, you guys were both talking about how they've continued to outperform even with people being naysayers and seeing other flags of perhaps some of the microns of the world raising issues about some of the chip sales. That said, I wonder about these currency headwinds. How much is that really an issue of dollars translating into these other currencies and then having some sort of uh, not having the pricing power? And how much is it that people in other nations are more flat on their back? And it's getting harder There's to sell. There's a little bit of that, and particularly in Europe. A company yeah. to company, Europe, there was sort of a mystery to Europe. Let's remember, it's a Europe at war. I mean, well, But it's also in China. Know. We've heard that they've tried to cut their prices in China. How do you break out? a pure FX kind of arrangement from a lack of demand no, from the, other you, regions you are that are, have a lot yeah, more pain right now. There are parts of the FX effect that aren't just an accounting gimmick of flows. There's no question. But the scale that Anurag Rana was talking about, of, we, we were trained 3 and 4%. 4% was a big number. And all of a sudden, the small number is now 8%, double. So the, this is, and to me, the question is, do you take it as a one-off as a share owner or is it something perpetual? And that's what we have to learn in the coming weeks. Apple right now up eight tenths of 1%. Do you want the question of the morning from a Bloomberg subscriber? Will Twitter, will Elon Musk follow me? Do you grow a beard or did you just have a late night? Uh, me? I just, no, me. I just didn't oh. shave this morning. No, it's it's part of the. It's isn't this part, part of the? Of the isn't this part look. of the, it's, it's the, the start of the weekend look? No. A football. What's the football well, look? The West Ham did well. You know. This is for West Ham. It's yeah, for Jim Keenan. You know. It's for Jim Keenan. He wanted to, you know, a World have a partner look. in his beard. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here's the price action on the S&P 500. Equity futures negative six tenths of one percent. Apple just about holding on. Amazon tanking. We'll talk about that name in just a moment. The Nasdaq negative one point one percent on the Nasdaq 100. But the big names this year has been big oil. Chevron out a little bit earlier this morning. Chevron posting the second highest profit ever. Exxon going one better, the highest profit in its 152-year history. It's a beat across the board here, Tom. The stock is up by 2.3% in early trading. And Exxon a little bit different in that it's always been treated as a financial institution that happens to run a hydrocarbon uh, business. It was run like a Swiss watch, Swiss watch for years. There's been real question about their gas acquisitions, natural gas acquisitions over time. But they're all be, being... A boom here, and what I'm going to focus on, John, is Brent Crude 9630. Can you imagine these companies' performance at Brent Crude revisiting 120? True. True. I mean, it's a really good point. And, and if China comes back online, what does talking, that look like, Tom? You've you know, talked you about it a million times. JP Morgan has been leading on this and the idea of picking up global demand. And I'm sorry, they, 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 we don't talk enough about these, these companies' global reach. I wonder what their FX effect is. I haven't found it yet. Well, the NatGas export story is a big part of the Exxon yes. story this, as well this morning. Lisa, you and I have talked about the politics of this a million times. I just wonder how much they lead into the CapEx numbers over at Exxon, just to oh, highlight yeah. that on the call, just to say, look how much we're investing. They see full-year CapEx at $21 billion or $24 billion. The estimate was 17.77. I imagine if that's a feature for them, yeah. just dear. <laughs> 
Joe Biden, dear Mr. <laughs> President, this yeah. is what we're doing. And he might respond, dear Exxon, you also raised your quarterly dividend by yes. three cents, down to 91 cents. So yes. why are you doing that? And also just notice that that, you know, $24 billion of CapEx or $21 billion is basically a rounding error for a company <laughs> that just uh, delivered a greater amount of earnings than Amazon, Procter & Gamble, and Tesla yeah. combined this year. I keep going back to this story, the tech story, alongside the energy story this yeah, year. It's shocking. And I go back to the words of Jeff Curry of Goldman, who said this was the revenge of the old economy. Now, when you see the prospect of a recession, you think about where the excess investment has been in the last decade or so. And quite clearly, it's gone into technology companies. It has not gone in to big oil. Big oil has not invested. CapEx has dropped off a cliff in many places around the world in this particular sector. And we're seeing the consequences of that, aren't we? But there's a deep angst <clears throat> underpinning this discussion because there is a feeling with one headline after another about some of the climate change issues yeah. that are facing the nation about how to come up with some sort of a plan longer term and what alternative sources. So how do you then say, you're right, we need to invest in you more over a longer term, yeah. which leads this to be a structural impact where potentially prices could be higher and they make bigger profits at least for the next 10 years? In the last decade, Exxon per year, Four percent per year. I mean, it's all recent. It's all. Hey, this year's been a big one, so I'm agreed. Shot. Let's move on right now. We're going to do that as we look at foreign exchange, the dollar. We can look at international economics. What Nathan Sheet said yesterday of a global slowdown. We do that with William Lee, chief economist at Milken Institute. Billy, thank you so much. Are you as gloomy as your good friend Nathan Sheets? Can you give me a global GDP of sub three percent for next year? It'll be even more of a sub-3% if China doesn't get its act together. And given what's happening in China now, it looks like it's not going to happen. So Nathan's a little optimistic because I think he's not revised down China enough, perhaps because of political reasons. What did you learn from the Congress of President Xi? Of course, the emotion we saw in that video, I believe it was just a week ago. But, Bill Lee, what did you learn? And particularly, what did you learn about Xi and Hong Kong? I think every Western investor is going to have to reassess political risk right now because China's focus is going to be to turn inward. They're going to say, we care about safety. We care about the, the threats to our country. We have to worry that the, the world is gathering around us. And, and so instead of having policies that strengthen growth uh, and, and bring back growth and productivity, they're going to be looking at national security, national safety. That diversion, I think, is going to mean a lot for Western investors because anybody who goes into China now has got to tell the Chinese uh, government that we will help you make your companies national champions. And unless we are doing that, we're not welcome. Bill, you slipped it in there. wasn't lost on us. <laughs> Do you think the South side refuses to downgrade China sufficiently for political reasons? Well, John, we've been here before, and, and um, I think I've gotten some feedback from my friends that are, have guns to my head now. Um, uh, but I think that there's a lot of pressure for companies who are in China, well-established companies like Citi, like JP Morgan, this financials, who need to have a presence because that's the nature of their global business. And if they start getting too pessimistic about China, I think one of the things that's going to happen is that they're going to start getting cut out. Uh, and, and in order to keep their business models going, they have to be um, cheerleaders for the administration. No well, what they're doing. How long will China remain an opportunity, though, for some of the multinationals? How long can they continue to basically play by the rules as put out there by the party Congress when the party Congress just basically said, we're not sure if we want you? Lisa, the companies that are there will stay there. But the real question is, where's the marginal dollar going? Where's the marginal investment going? And I think, uh, given what's happening in China, at least for the next several years until the dust settles and we get a clear direction for where deal circulation goes, the, the, the marginal dollar is going to be going to ASEAN and, and Korea because those are the opportunities, those are the growth zones. Because China has diverted away from the companies that really have given them the growth over the last several decades, the high-tech, high in, highly innovative private sector companies. Xi Jinping has made it very clear, going forward, we're going to be emphasizing growing our national champions and state-owned enterprises. Well, that is, is almost an oxymoron to say highly productive state-owned enterprises. So the marginal dollar, the smart model, marginal dollar, is going toward ASEAN and Korea. Bill, in the past five days since the party congress had ended, we've seen a 9 percent decline in Chinese stocks traded in Hong Kong. It is a record decline in the equity markets uh, following this meeting. How much do you take a signal from this that's lasting, where foreign money will not be welcome in China, it will not return, and there will be a very different look with a much slower growth profile for a longer period of time in China? Well, Lisa, not only have valuations gone down, uh, but 
the actual number of dollars is coming out. And I think that says a lot about both supply and demand. Um, the, 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 the Chinese have said, you're not welcome unless you're helping us develop national champions. And, and quite frankly, the, the desire to be in that huge market uh, has gone right. down because Xi Jinping has made it very clear, this huge market is for Chinese companies. If you're gonna help us develop the Chinese market for Chinese companies, come on in. But if you're not gonna be doing that, if you're gonna be doing what you've been doing for the last 100 years, exploiting us, stay out. And that's, the, that's a very clear message. Billy, I was thunderstruck at the meetings in Washington that used to live and breathe and how people weren't talking about Fed talk and bank central bank chatter. They were talking about dollar liquidity and swap lines. As we go into this weekend, give us the Bill Lee swap line update. Is it something to worry about? Keep an eye on what QT does to bank liquidity around the world. Uh, that's where we're going to see the drying up of liquidity because I don't think the Fed has really realized that it, it has to really have strong repo markets and non-bank markets in order to facilitate the 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 the, the, the withdrawal of liquidity from the banking system. And and when once that happens here in the United States, it'll have global implications around the world because. Liquidity not only will dry up here, it'll dry up way around the world. Does that fold over to a more uh, accommodative monetary policy? Does the balance sheet and repo challenge become a discussion at the Fed press conference November 2nd? Tom, bite your tongue, because the one thing the Fed cannot afford to have anyone say is they're not credible. And and any kind of uh, inflection point now, before inflation turns around, is going to destroy that hard-won credibility uh, post uh, post. Yeah, Jackson but Hill. Bill, we, we have a hard-won credibility with a balance sheet that William <laughs> McChesney Martin never envisioned. The two, and John Farrell's been great at this, the two have to dovetail together. What do you predict over the next three, four Fed meetings is they dovetail balance sheet dynamics with some form of monetary theory. John has been very spot on to say, keep an eye on the Fed and ECB because the place they're gonna blink, it's not so much in, uh, in, in the rate uh, and the, the speed by which they raise rates, it's gonna be how they do QT. Uh, ECB has a, a huge aversion to anything starting with Q. So we know they're gonna be QE forever, uh, but the Fed, uh, may actually start to blink because if financial stability starts to rear its head and we have volatility in the repo markets and non-bank markets, that's where you're going to see some easing. And, and, and that will be caught by markets and we will start to lose the credibility and inflation expectations will start to take off again. Hey, Bill. Wonderful. As always, Bill Lee there of the Milken Institute. We're looking at the ECB, not just the Fed. I'm impressed with us this morning. It took us about 38 minutes before we discussed the Fed, Tom. And it was you, not me or Lisa. Did you okay? So there we go. No, I, CPI. He said you're spot on. And Bill Lee never says I'm spot on. It's always He you. told you to bite your tongue. I know. He did. Can you do that for I'm 10 seconds? Bill Lee time I'm trying. <laughs> just as Three, I go through the CPI two, data one. out of Italy. 12.8%, Tom, CPI in Italy this morning, year over year. The estimate, do you know what the estimate was? 9.9. .9. That's a big upside surprise. It's a big upside surprise. And, you know, it's a bunch of elite stuff. With I got I pulled out one of my ancient bow ties today. It's a bunch of elite stuff with fancy bow ties and beards that need to be shaved. And the bottom line is, you know what? It's not about elite idiots like us. Italy's flat on its back. It's a struggle. Take us south of, take us south of Rome. Nobody goes south of Rome except Sicily. What's it like down there? They're flat on their back. Look, look where my family... Uh, Tom, it's a very, very tough time. Of course, yeah. it's a struggle and always has been historically and needs to get a whole lot better. 12% inflation? It's a cost of living crisis, Tom. We know that. In Germany, though, I think this is the key difference between now, Lisa, and maybe 10 years ago. The weak spot in Europe right now is Germany. It's Germany. And yeah. I'm looking at the breakdown of the regional stuff for CPI in Germany this morning and we'll get headlined in about an hour and 20 minutes. It ain't great. It's not great. You did see an upside surprise with respect to GDP in Germany and a downside surprise in France and Spain. And this is partly because the weather hasn't been as bad as people thought, right? I mean, essentially, you haven't had the same kind of pressures. That said, how does this equation change and where does the balance of power go, particularly given some of the heat that Italy has felt to be austere, to not invest in some of these things in previous years? Given where 3Q GDP just came out in Germany, which was better than expected, and we need to highlight that, and given where CPI is this morning, Lisa, you'd have to imagine it's going to be difficult for this ECB to back off anytime soon, regardless of what they told us yesterday. Well, and this is the reason why people are expecting them to keep going. And if they don't, that could be a real liability with the long end really taking off in terms of yield.
Equity futures right now, negative six tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Amazon getting hammered in the pre-market, down about 12%. Apple just about holding on. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Elon Musk is cleaning house at Twitter. He's completed his $44 billion acquisition of the company, and Bloomberg's learned he's gotten rid of the CEO and other major executives. Musk plans to be Twitter's chief executive for now. He also intends to do away with permanent ban on users, a category that includes former President Trump. Meanwhile, the former president shelled out $20 million this month to support Senate candidates he's endorsed. The money came from his $92 million in donations, the most in the Republican Party. It's being used for advertising in Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. In a new Bloomberg survey, economists predict the Fed will keep laying the groundwork for interest rates to reach 5% by next March. They expect that to likely trigger a U.S. and global recession. Next week, the economists see policymakers raising rates by 75 basis points for a fourth consecutive meeting. In China, Premier Li Keqiang has repeated pledges to stabilize the economy and stimulate growth in the fourth quarter. Li says it's crucial to implement measures addressing the lack of effective demand and to boost consumption. This week, data showed China's economic growth accelerated to 3.9 percent in the fourth quarter. And Volkswagen has cut back its sales expectations for the year. Europe's biggest car maker now sees deliveries on par with last year when semiconductor shortages were severely hampered output. VW is still being hampered by all the availability of chips and logistics remain a challenge. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Understand though that inflation is too high. The president gets it. He's been working to get prices, uh, gas prices down. So as a result, they've been coming down for the last three weeks or so. Uh, but we understand that that's partially due to the war in Ukraine, and we need to keep oil on the market. That was Cecilia Rouse there, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Let's get you up to speed on the price action this Friday morning. Good morning to you. Equities down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Yields much higher. Trying to reclaim a four handle on a ten year. We do there that. It is. Bingo. Just for you, TK. In the FX market, the euro digits. dollar ninety nine. 37 on euro dollar, negative a third of 1%. CPI out of Germany, one hour and 12 minutes away, Tom. Looking for a punchy number there too. Surveillance difference, John. Let's go over this. When we do data checks, folks, often we go to three digits, four digits. There's a, each, each thing, there's a convention. There's a way to do it right. And we do it the global Wall Street way. We're already screaming about that. That's a team effort, Tom. Team effort. Just team surveillance trying to get to four digits. We do the Dow sometimes too. We do the Dow Jones you know, Industrial Average as we can. Of course, bang. outperforming. Do you know that the Dow <laughs> one year trailing is out of correction stage? It's nice. 9. Point X percent down. Mm. I think most people don't know that. I like to look at the equal yeah. weight S&P 500. That's too. very cool, too. And the yeah. value line geometric is my all time favorite. Just to strip out the muscle of big tech, yeah. just to show what's been going on more broadly. Yeah. Next week, we cover the Wilshire 5000. Nice. Ellen Wald is the only one in oil that understands what the Wilshire 5000 is. She's senior fellow at Atlantic Council, <laughs> and we get a brief on oil. Ellen, parse Exxon with a 10-year total return of 4% per year as compared to the moonshot of the last 24 months. Does someone like you, an academic, do you just assume big oil can sustain the moonshot? I'd say basically what we're seeing is the boom bust cycle that uh, is always been evident in oil and, and commodities, but oil uh, in particular, you know, things were down for a while. Now they're way up. The big question is uh, the typical cycle that we see is we get big investments in CapEx when uh, oil companies' profits are high. And I'm not sure that we're going to be seeing that right. this time. And that could be a huge problem. That's a constructive idea in that the rap is when things are good, they go off to the Arctic tundra and waste billions of dollars on a project that never pays off. Are those days over? 
I definitely think those days are over. Um, everyone seems to have learned their lesson from that. The question is, uh, are we going to see more than, say, 20 or $24 billion in CapEx investment this year from Exxon? And Exxon's one of the, the companies that actually is increasing production. They've uh, increased production in the Permian. They're doing a lot of work in Guyana. They've made a lot of great uh, discoveries there. And they really have a potential, I think, and, and the mindset to uh, really go out there and do a lot more investment. But if we don't see more coming from them, I mean, put this in perspective, their profits this quarter are equal to what they're basically spending in CapEx for the year. That's just not nearly enough. And in today's uh, environment, today's price environment, what we're seeing in terms of global production, we need massive amounts of investment now so that we actually have oil and gas in the future. So Ellen, we were talking about the political liability for the Exxons of the world, which of which there's one, it's Exxon, I suppose, raising their dividend by three cents to 91 cents and really reporting just blockbuster earnings, how much blowback from the white House. Who has the upper hand here, though? Because Exxon could come back and say, look, we're actually providing the oil uh, and the natural gas that you need to lower prices for consumers. Yeah, that's a, a really, really good question. And there's definitely this back and forth going on with the White House. I would definitely expect to see, um, you know, the White House come out guns blazing, uh, you know, midterm elections are coming up, and they're going to blast these oil companies for what they're doing with their profits and for the prices that consumers are currently paying at the pump. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to actually do anything to uh, potentially harm these companies. Now, what's going on now is we've got lawsuits in a, a number of states, more than I think two dozen across uh, the country that are trying to basically get oil companies, Exxon, Chevron, uh, ConocoPhillips and, and others to pay for um, you know infrastructure damage from climate change events. And uh, the question is, are these lawsuits going to get thrown out or are they going to uh, go forward and could potentially be major drains on these companies' uh, funds? So uh, this is something that, you know, the White House could potentially influence and say, hey, pull back. I don't think they are. Ellen, at the heart of this really is a question of how long the transition to a more dominant presence of cleaner energy uh, we have ahead of us, right? I mean, if it's a 10-year window and some of these big oil majors are investing heavily in this, then there will be less cloud and there'll be less of a concern. How far away are we? What is the time frame? How significant will this be changing in terms of the sources of energy in a decade? I think we're a lot farther away than we think we are and that we're, we think we are based on these companies' investments. If you look at the investments that they're actually making, uh, particularly the American ones, the European ones invest a lot more in renewables than the American ones. And as a consequence, their uh, profits this quarter are like 13% lower than the American companies. Um, but a lot of these investments aren't aren't real. So look at Chevron. They uh, were a bit down because of their refining margins, but their sales for products are actually up because they acquired a renewable fuels company. Well, if their sales are up, but their profits are still lower, then is that company really worthwhile? Are these renewable fuels or synthetic fuels really profitable? And I think that's the question uh, that these companies have to ask themselves as they go forward in this environment. You moved on too quickly from that point. Can we sit on that, Ellen? just for one more, the idea that the older energy companies not making the big renewable shift are doing better this year than those that have. I mean, that just tells us that oil and gas, legacy, legacy oil sources are still absolutely vital to our society, to the way that we function, to our modern life, and that they're going to continue to be. It's not like, you know, just because uh, people have decided they want to ban the sale of internal combustion cars in 2030, that that means that we're all suddenly going to have this magical, great renewable source of, of fuel and transportation. That's just not uh, likely to happen. And I think it is more likely that we will continue to see a very slow transition unless there's some extreme major breakthrough in technology. And Ellen, oil and gas will be very important. And I'm well, thank you, of the Atlantic Council. I feel like many people just sort of got slapped in the face by reality this year with the energy story. <clears throat> Tom, the reality of a war in Europe, the reality of the politi politicians, political relationships breaking down, whether it's Saudi and the United States more recently and Russia and the rest of the world, much of the world, over the last year. In the social aspect, which Ellen, by the way, folks, captures brilliantly in her book on Saudi Arabia, John, the social aspect here 
is emerging markets, developing economies. They are energy intensive and they are energy hungry and they're using energy as a tool to catch up with the developing world. Yep, That's well a said. core thesis. Without a doubt. Did I do okay there? That was wonderful. I'm killing it. Would you like, would you like, I can leave right now. I'm going to give you a data point in the morning, okay? This comes from Kevin Crowley here at Bloomberg. The dividend hike from Exxon <clears throat> makes it now 40 years of consecutive increases. Yeah, years. I've always underplayed this. Remember the you know the, the the new Hermes building on Madison Avenue was Bank of New York. And Have you seen had, that? They've had it's dividend huge. increases since. I haven't been in. I, I wouldn't shop at Hermes. But of course not. The, um, thank you. Uh, but the um, the um, I lost my train of thought. Lisa's here. sitting there thinking, I swear Please I saw you in an Hermes <laughs> bow tie earlier this week. <laughs> yeah. But well, you yeah, definitely no, did. I, I just shrugged that off. I was like, all right. Why they opened in Shanghai two days ago, mega how, store. How busy are they? They're busy. I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. This is Bloomberg, apparently. Demand seems to be recovering too fast for supply to catch up. There is a case for the ECB to hike into a recession, of course. Yes, it has to do some and make some fairly painful and unpalatable decisions when we are undergoing a slowdown. We're calling next year rolling recessions in the global economy. We are getting closer to that point where the Fed can decelerate its pace of hikes, but we're not there yet. Everyone here is making it up as they go because we really have not been in this position for so many decades. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a week. How many times have we said that this year? Yeah. What a week. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow. Futures down, Tom, by five or six tenths of one percent. I said it a few times this morning already. Apple just about holding on. Apple holding on and maybe the one constructive story out there. I mean, oil, big constructive story this morning with Exxon and Chevron uh, as well. But you're right. And what it really means, John, is you can't take it as an industry group. The idea of big tech, I don't buy. Meta is dramatically different than Apple. Meta, down hard. Alphabet, down hard. <clears throat> Microsoft down hard, Lisa Amazon down 12.6% in the pre-market. And we've been talking all morning about how the performance of the, these shares in the aftermarket are probably more interesting than the actual earnings. What I find, find really fascinating, Anur Agrana of Bloomberg Intelligence coming out and saying he had already downgraded his expectations substantially. And yet they still disappointed. And it's not just in real time. It's the forward look. How much of this is due to international? How much do we start yeah. to discuss about the uh, idea of the weakness around the globe becoming the U.S. problem and really calling for some action? Yeah, you mentioned that this morning, John. And to me, Lisa's dead on. This is an international rate of change story. I couldn't agree more. We'll get CPI a little bit later this morning out of Germany. Looking forward to that in about an hour. I'm sure Germany's not looking forward to that because that read's going to be terrible. Is Anne-Marie joining us this morning? Yes. I, I believe she is on. Talk our about schedule. The politics She's fitting us in. of these oil earnings this morning. Lisa, that is a big deal. Especially because this is basically one of the linchpins of this administration. They've said, we are trying to combat inflation by bringing down gasoline prices. We're going to do everything that we can, and they can see those profits that are the biggest ever. Okay, but for are, are we going to allocate capital like Europe where they're going to go after Total profits, windfall profits, or are we going to have windfall profit tax here? We have two weeks. What can they actually do other than just simply malign them? I mean, other than, I mean, I like how okay, you okay looked do? at your watch that isn't there <laughs> to tell us how many weeks we've got into the mix. Yeah, I, have, I have weird habits. What can I say? <laughs> well, you see just, that? You know, it was I, like that. I thought that it was radio. great, you know? Ramo crushing it. <clears throat> to your point, there's a message Every here from Exxon yeah. to the White House, and it reads as follows The investments we've made, even through the pandemic, enabled us to increase production to address the needs of consumers. That's from the Exxon CEO this morning. I don't think they're going to read that out loud in the press briefing over at the White House. No, especially because the profits are so big and the investments are not really that big. I mean, Ellen Wald was saying well, it's basically a rounding error for them. And how much can this really play into the hands of the White House at a time when they are raising their dividend for the 40th straight well, year? Well, Fulton Anne-Marie Horton here, and this is important. And Greg Vallier with a blistering note of what everybody notices now, Democratic panic in his simple phrases, even New York. I mean, you know, what is going to be the Exxon debate, the Chevron debate, if you have a substantial Republican House, dare I say, a Republican Senate? And what does that mean for Democrat and GOP politics adjusting to 2024? How does that fit into oil? Throw in the Fed debate as well. 
We can throw in the How politics. Are you going to throw in a sprinkle debate? of the politics yeah. around the Federal Reserve too. Another Senate Democrat oh, yeah. coming out and asking the Federal Reserve to pause yeah. interest rate hikes. <clears throat> Although this was more aggressive. Oh, this was not, way yeah, more direct. And, and that's really interesting. Sherrod Brown uh, took a more reserved stance saying this could be problematic. This new one was basically saying, stop it already. Just cut it out. You can pause it and we're going to be fine. Just don't torpedo the economy. Like a parent to a child. 100%. Stop it already. <laughs> Features right now on the <laughs> S&P down is. about six tenths of 1% <laughs> on the S&P 500. Chairman Powell the child in that scenario, for the senators at least. What do you make of that, Tom? It's always the battle, and again, it has to do with moving from Stan Fisher's ultra-accommodative to accommodative to some form of neutrality. You mentioned James Diamond uh, talking about now the hefty, heavy lifting begins. Well, we're there in November 2nd. i got to get the calendar out. I'm sorry. I, I don't have the Fed meetings members. I memorize Bank of Japan meetings. You've got the Fed uh, meeting right. November, November 2nd, 2nd, December 14th. I may work both days, which would be good. You're going to turn up? I, I might show up. That would be nice. Lisa's going to be here, too. I promise to be around as well. Lisa, Tom going to show up. I'm so pleased to hear that and we'll get some Fed speak right after so we can look forward to that. And what we're looking forward to today is the last slew of data before that particular meeting, but also before the election. The last data that I think is really going to make a huge difference. U.S. employment cost index for the third quarter. How much do we start to see uh, the pace of wage hikes decline versus the opposite? Actually see it increase because there is signs of tightness of labor, particularly in certain areas. We also get U.S. personal income and spending for the month of September. I'm actually curious how much people are spending on borrowed money. We just saw credit card borrowings go up to the highest levels going back to 2019. So that might be part of the reason why we're seeing people continue to spend. 10 a.m. we get University of Michigan sentiment survey for the month of October. How much does this continue to directly correlate with gas prices, gasoline prices? They typically, when gasoline prices go up, this survey goes down. How much does that affect the election? And today we do get an, uh, an ongoing uh, churn of earnings. We did get Chevron and Exxon earlier this morning. Later this morning we hear from Mike Worth, Chevron CEO, Scott Sheffield, CEO of Pioneer Natural Resources. Both those shares popping uh, in pre-market trading. But John, as we've been talking about the political ramifications, what is the blowback going to be like at a time when people are worried about how high gas prices are? They're worried about the winter. And then you see these companies making bank. That's a great lineup a little bit later this morning. I'm sure Alex Steele and Guy Johnson are going to crush that, Tom, a little bit later, 10 a.m. Eastern time to hear from some of the oil majors. Yeah, well, they're going to hear from the oil majors and they're going to send, but John, they're going to spin it with the optimism of a changed political landscape in Washington. Sure. They've got to slot that in well, I think right now with the dynamics that we're seeing. The administration is going to have some yeah. things to say this morning, no doubt. Yeah. Katie Kaminsky joins us now, Chief Research Strategist at Alpha Simplex. Katie, you're much more than that. You guys have had a massive year. Katie, can you walk me through what's worked this year and what hasn't worked this week? Yes, that's a good question. I mean, in the first part of the year, the narrative was inflation. So we were very much seeing long signals in commodities, short signals in fixed income for the first time since 1994. But later in the year, this narrative has changed. It's been a draft between the recession fear versus rising rates and the impact of the relative strength of the dollar. So the dollar trade has probably been the biggest mover since the summer, and the short bond trade continues right. to be the focus of many of the uh, technical community, those of us who follow momentum signals. Uh, Catherine Kaminsky, into the weekend, everyone is going to read on Turtle Trading, John Henry, and Alpha Simplex. You are up 40% plus this year using trend-based studies. Explain to our audience what you didn't do to generate a return larger than the triple leveraged all cash fund. So trend strategies are really about following what the market is doing, not what the market should do. And I think that's where we're in a very good position because Frankly, nobody knows what the market is or should do going forward, given the complexity of the new macro environment that we're in. So I think in that sense, it's really been difficult to make a call on something that most investors have never lived through. And in a different macro environment than most of us really have sort of been used to. I mean, look at the correlations. Today is a perfect example. Today we have stocks down, bonds down, dollar up again. And that's a very strange um, cross-asset theme, but it's the prevailing theme in this type of environment. Katie, can you find any kind of theme when it comes to the optimism in stocks, perversely, from this idea that the Fed's going to back away, and then the pessimism on the tech uh, in the tech universe after some of these earnings? That's a good question because, like, 
earnings coming in is just another data point that people have to absorb to try and understand this narrative. And we look at what's been happening now, obviously duration exposure is something that a lot of tech uh, investors are thinking about, but also the fact that you're really seeing that divergence across sectors, across economies, across the world. So we're really seeing, even though there's key macro themes, these macro changes are really creating winners and losers in this particular environment. So it's making it a very interesting environment to be a tactical trader or someone that's looking for sort of deviations from the mean. It's not just a stocks always go up, buy your 60-40 environment this year, which means that there's opportunities for those um, who are a little more tactical. Katie, you've been tremendous this year. Congratulations to you and the team. Katie Kaminsky there of Alpha Simplex. Tom, I do wonder, do you think anyone's ever walked into like Schwab somewhere on Main Street and asked for the triple left fridge? Or cash no, they do. Yeah, you think, no, they've, no, you think they've ever asked I, for an I've allocation? Got a book, I got a book in treatment on this right now. I've always uh, wondered. Sure. I want that. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I mean, it, triple leverage is a little difficult. There's a white paper that was put out years ago that the leverage, the, the re leverage pivot point, mathematically, is two point eight to one. But because of the marketing goose we're getting, we go three to one instead of 2.8 to one. And what really makes it worthwhile is with a triple leverage, I can get a two and 20 split in the fee nice. versus a normal money market fund fee. Are you ready to reti retire this year? No, we don't think this okay. year. We, we need to see rates come in. We need to see the Fed to blink mm. before I can talk about retirement. Just Can I do a public service announcement? Please, please do. This is made up right now. So anyone <laughs> going to be looking for this triple leverage all cash fund? Please use your time I more wisely. I thought the disclaimer ran <laughs> across the that. bottom of the screen for yeah. the whole show. Yeah, you have to do yeah, that periodically. Exactly. I thought it was down the small print. Yeah, it's in the small print. Please disregard everything well, we're, that we're you hear. We're looking at an international fund. You know, we're looking at an international fund, but I can't get the two and 20 if I go international. In all seriousness, FIS Futures in right London now. is really a problem. Trying to get out of this. I started it. Futures down by 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. Big turnaround in the bond market up nine basis yeah. points. What you'll notice in Europe is that yields were lower in Germany by something like 15 yeah. basis points. Yeah. This morning, they're higher by 15 basis points. I don't think this bond market volatility lease has settled down really in a material <clears throat> way at That's, all. I would completely agree. And it goes to the point that you were talking about German GDP earlier. It came in higher than expected. So this basically gives more of a pass to the ECB to keep hiking rates and shows that things are not cooperating as much as they would like. I, Chris Lowe of FDN did a fabulous note yesterday tearing apart the optimistic GDP number of America. Are you being pessimistic? He You're tore being it pessimistic. Shreds. You Why sound a, less constructive. A, yeah. On a net export basis, Chris Lowe hit the ball out of the park yesterday. You want the president's words on it? I wrote it down. Oh, please. I'll, I'll find them for you. With today's third quarter GDP, we got further evidence that our economic recovery is continuing to power forward. There we are, the anti-Chris Lowe. <laughs> yes, uh, somewhat different to what the economists are saying. Futures down <clears throat> seven tenths. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Elon Musk has begun putting his stamp on Twitter. The world's richest person closed his $44 billion takeover of the platform and has begun firing its major executives. Bloomberg's learned Musk plans to assume the role of CEO. He also plans to do away with permanent bans on users, a category that includes former President Trump. Hopes that the Eurozone can stave off a recession got a boost today. Germany defied expectations by reporting another quarter of economic growth. The country's gross domestic product rose by three-tenths of one percent in the third quarter. But momentum slowed in both France and in Spain. French growth went from one-half of one percent to two-tenths of a percent. In Spain, GDP rose a worse-than-expected two-tenths of one percent. Big earnings for big oil. ExxonMobil Exxon posted the highest profit in its 152-year history. Natural gas demand and prices surge. Exxon's earnings are expected on track to exceed $500 billion for the whole year. It was a similar story over at Chevron, which posted its second highest profit in history. Again, it was soaring natural gas prices stemming from Russia's invasion of Ukraine that drove earnings. And Amazon has shocked Wall Street by predicting the slowest holiday quarter growth in the company's history. It says sales during the current period will rise just 2 to 8% as shoppers reduce their spending in the face of economic uncertainty. Shares of Amazon were down by a double-digit percentage in pre-market trading. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This 
is Bloomberg. season is here. The earnings are starting to pour in. The numbers are holding up better than expected. Sorry, business isn't all that bad. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Netflix earnings going across the wire. A big beat. Stock is up more than 8%. Coming in stronger than their rivals. With exclusive expert analysis. Finally back to growth. The mother of all opportunities. What is the industry to watch? That's where the rubber hits the road for Goldman Sachs. It's going to be a really interesting earnings season. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Making these chips in America is going to help lower the cost for families looking to buy a car to replace your washing machine, get a new cell phone. It also helps companies outcompete the rest of the world. And I've got heard from Xi Jinping that he's a little concerned about that. President Joe Biden there. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Good morning to you. Or happy Friday, as some might say, with Tom Keane, Lisa Brown, and Jonathan Farrow. The reason I'm laughing in the commercial break, Tom. You hate Happy Friday. I hate it with a passion. <laughs> Why do you hate Happy Friday? I hate it for Friday? a number of reasons, but let me tell you this. You go in on sure. Wall Street, you go in on Saturday, and you get more done on Saturday yeah, I mean, from 8 to 11 a.m. than you do the rest of the week combined. Top tip on a trading floor, maybe don't walk in as an intern and say to everybody, Happy Friday. <laughs> okay, I say Happy Friday to him, Drew Story. I hate it. And, I he hate says, it. and he says, what's good about it? What's good about what's it? What's good about it? Well, it's Friday. Happy good Monday. Good morning. I'll say good morning. Happy what's Monday. good about Friday it? Friday does my head. I hate that. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll, Happy I'll Monday. That and Monday mind. starts 7 p.m. Sunday night when Japan opens. Try 2 p.m. Tom, much, much earlier. We're a joy. A lot of people. That <laughs> That's not when Japan opens. But anyway, futures are down by six tenths of one percent on the S&P. We got some pushback from another Democratic senator, this time John Hickenlooper, Tom, <clears> who yeah. said this of Colorado. Yes. High inflation necessitates a response, but the concern is the Fed is doing too much too quickly. I write to urge the Federal Reserve to pause and seriously consider the negative consequences of, again, raising interest rates. So we've got Hickenlooper, Sanders, Warren and Sherrod Brown now, Tom. It is a movable feast two weeks before the election into an interesting weekend, to say the least. Anne-Marie Horton with a brief from Washington. Anne-Marie, I'm going to go to some of the statistics that you see on food inflation. Food inflation is something like 11.2 percent. The average back to World War I is 3.4 percent per year. Does anything else matter? Well, a lot of other things matter. Food inflation is one of them. How much people are paying in rent. I mean, we've been talking about for months about gasoline prices. It's the one thing that actually the White House really wants you to know is that those prices are down, even though they say if you look at market dynamics and the refining margins, they should actually be closer to $3.20 across the average. But, Tom, the heart of the matter is whatever it is that is going up, consumer prices across the board are going up. And this is why the polls, especially in the last final weeks going into the midterm election, you see them tightening. And even in some places, like we were just talking about before right. we started the program, places like Oregon and the governor's race starting to tilt towards this potential Republican win. And a lot of this has to do with not just the economy, but also really this, this candidate taking aim on homelessness, on crime. But that would be a huge defeat for the Democrats, just this one particular okay, race, well, because we haven't seen a Republican governor since okay. the early 80s. We staggered through the Sunday talk shows, look for Face the Nation, among others, on uh, Bloomberg Radio uh, in the afternoon, hugely popular. Emory, great. We get through the Sunday talk shows. How do the two sides recalibrate, given the dynamics of the last week? What's the plan next week? So for the Democrats, what you've seen them trying to do is, at first, they really wanted to make this midterm elections about Roe v. Wade, right, and really about abortion rights. And now they're realizing they need to talk about the economy. So their argument is that you cannot leave it up to the Republicans in terms of making uh, of terms of the next few years and what that would mean for the economy. And they're really trying to tout the legislation they've got done, the Inflation Reduction Act, and of course, last summer, the Hard Infrastructure Act, where they worked with Republicans. For the Republicans, the message hasn't changed. It's been for months. Inflation's at a 40-year high, 
and they say that the cities are more dangerous and people are upset regarding crime and in some cities homelessness. That message hasn't changed. What you have seen is the Democrats kind of weave in between we're better for the economy at the same time, Roe v. Wade is on the ballot, and they haven't really been able to hone in on one specific message. What's the response to some of these earnings that we heard of the uh, big tech, uh, big oil, excuse me, I slipped because the leadership has changed this year, the big oil uh, companies? Well, we heard from the president yesterday going after Shell and their profits as well as their dividend. The president saying, why are they giving money back to shareholders? They should be giving it to consumers and bringing down pump prices. Wait till the president of the United States wakes up and sees the Exxon earnings. They're even beating their own profits, and they are bringing, uh, a, having a dividend, uh, 40 years consistent of a dividend. This is something that the Democrats wow. are really going to rally, rally Did again. Did you see how she you nailed that heard... financial analysis? Anne-Marie <laughs> just absolutely nailed that. Thanks, Tom. Well, remember, One she used to cover point... the oil majors, Tom. Really? In London. Yeah. yeah. And also yeah, used to cover to... OPEC in Vienna. She's dabbled. I think she's she knows, dabbled. She knows what okay. she's talking about. Okay, thank you. Carry if on, I could just say, If I could just say one more point about how the Democrats are going to use this, we already also heard from Senator Murphy. It's not just the president that's using the bully, uh, pulpit to talk about oil uh, majors. You heard from Senator Murphy taking a, uh, on Twitter, talking about the fact that look at these uh, profits, and also if Republicans get in power, then it's these guys, the oil majors, which by and large, there's not many people who love oil companies. He's saying that these are the companies that are going to be influencing the Republican Party. And nobody better to talk about it down in D.C. than you. AMH, Amory, thank you. Amory, thank you. Amory, down in D.C. on the All Majors. And I imagine maybe a comment from this White House, Lisa, a little bit later this morning. Yeah, although how do you muddy the message at this moment? Because there's so many different messages, as Anne-Marie was laying out. You've got both the social issues, you've got the economic issues, the economic issues front and center at a time where an increasing number of senators are pointing the finger at the Fed, at them actually crimping growth and seeing that concern start to be more in the forefront. But, you know, I, I just I'm wondering what the cohesive message is when a growing number of Americans cannot afford the basic staples of their life, even as the upper crust continue to buy. You look for someone else to blame, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And that's what seems to be happening, Tom, within two weeks of yeah. the midterms. Yes, that emotion is there as well. But I'm just going to go back to basic stuff. Food inflation of 11.2%. Whatever the number is. I mean, it's above 10%. Let's make it double-digit food inflation. When did we see that, and how long did it persist? Most people alive today have never seen this. Can I just say, you know, everyone's blaming the Democrats. If the Republicans were in power, everyone would be blaming the Republicans. Fair. The Republicans can just keep pointing the fingers and pile on, and then it will be their turn, and then they'll have their situation. But the short term, so back and simple. forth, the frustration is, where do you get a meeting of the minds where people can actually say, look, we have some serious problems, but it doesn't play to the electorate. You know, it doesn't work. Come on, back to 1802, it doesn't play that way. Which is very frustrating for well, Okay, but the fact is, since the beginning of the country, Alien Sedition Act, etc., it's always been just like it is now, massive polarization. Is Britain any different, John? Not really. Both sides are always going to blame each other. Ultimately, though, what's the solution? If you get divided government, then maybe that actually does this administration a favour when it comes to inflation, because there'll be two years of being able to do nothing. Right. And ultimately, you know what's going to happen with prices if that's, if that's the case? Well, the you muddle have to imagine through. they come down because growth's going to get hammered. The democracy of America is the muddle through, and that's sort of the success of it, ironically. Sure. Futures down a half of 1% on the S&P. Yeah. What about it? 147-ish, 148 ish It's not off the radar. Just sounded erratic, Tom. That's all. Well, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's fine. erratic Friday. I don't mind. It's happy a happy Friday. Friday. It's Friday. <laughs> What'd you call it, Friday? <laughs>from New York, equity futures down four tenths of one percent on the S&P, closing out the trading week. Just a little lighter, softer on the Nasdaq again, off by eight tenths of one percent. At least we'll talk about the success of fossil fuels and the failure of big tech this week in just a moment. That's the equity market. Look at the bond market. Where we were last Friday and where we are this morning, twos, tens, and thirties. Last Friday, front end of the yield curve had a little look at 460. Right now, 435. We've backed away. Last Friday, we closed out the week for a twelfth consecutive weekly gain in 10-year yields this week, right the way back in by more than 20 basis points on the session. Yields up, but on the week, yields much lower. That's the bond market. Let's talk about foreign exchange, euro dollar. Some euro strength on the week, unchanged on the session. The next stop for this one is about 30 minutes away. CPI in Germany. 
TK, CPI out of France, upside surprise. Out of Italy, upside surprise. Maybe just a little bit softer in Spain, but Germany at the heart of this mess. Germany's going to have a big one in about 30 minutes' time. And we saw that from Italy as well. And the answer, John, is I don't need to know the number. All I need to know is the phrase double digit, and that's where we are. Double digit CPI, growth set to roll over, and an ECB that's going to have to hike potentially a whole lot more. Look out for that in about 30 minutes. Euro dollar right now, just below parity. Let's get you some single names. We can do that with Bramo. Morning, Lisa. Good morning. Today I'm looking at the differential between fossil fuels that are flying and big tech that is not because John evidently knows me that well that he can know exactly what I'm going to say and how I'm going to frame it out. But it is the story of the morning and we've been talking about it. Chevron came in one of its biggest profits ever. Those shares up uh, nearly 2%. But again, these have been crushing it all year. Exxon is really the standout. A record profit. A profit that is expected to be bigger than a lot of major companies combined this year. It really is standing out. Those shares up just 2.1% because again those shares are up more than 50 percent year to date they are increasing their dividend as tom was mentioning uh for the 40th consecutive year to 91 cents and pioneer uh, and natural uh coming up also about two percent uh, their ceo speaking on bloomberg later it's just a sort of shocking to see the numbers that already had high expectations absolutely blow them out of the water it is the opposite story in big tech we heard from amazon last night we heard from apple last night apple hung in there amazon did not amazon shares down 12 percent already those shares are down more than 33% year to date. So this really brings it to a pain level that we have not seen. Apple shares climbing up just a little bit, uh, three quarters of a percent after they beat expectations on the headline. But it's because of Mac sales. People are buying Max. That's basically the reason why they that actually disappointed. Surprise. That is a surprise. <clears throat> yeah, and it, it actually was. disappointed, Tom, with the iPhones. The iPhone sales numbers came in light, which is their bread and butter, and they are concerned and raised some flags about heading into the winter quarter. I'm not saying it's all doom and gloom. It's just that even the one stalwart definitely highlighted the mm. moment that we're in, especially uh, with the uh, foreign exchange pressures. And Tesla, this is the last day it's going to be up here, so I figured I had to highlight it. It is being delisted today, Tom after the purchase. Twitter Twitter, uh, Twitter pay, uh, shares are uh, being delisted. Tesla shares, excuse me, uh, are not being delisted. Those and shares lower that. as he comes out, as uh, Elon Musk comes out and tries to uh, take the helm of Twitter. Lisa, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Your conversation to get into the weekend on fixed income. Ian Lingen now joins us, head of U.S. rate strategy, BMO Capital Markets, out of the University of Minnesota finance shop, which is a big deal when you look at the quality of the Minnesota Fed, Minneapolis Fed uh, as well. Ian, we got eight ways to go here. It could be a two-hour conversation. I'm going to go right now to the short-term trust market overnight. Swap lines of Switzerland twice now in the last number of weeks. Worries about swap lines uh, worldwide. And the litmus paper for this is F-R-A-O-I-S. We're talking about Happy Friday and all this stuff. Happy F-R-A-O-I-S. What does it signal that this short-term ratio is through the roof? I think that the biggest issue at this moment is a dollar shortage globally. Now, we've seen the run-up in rates domestically. We've seen the run-up in rates in Europe as well, not only policy rates, but also overall yields. And as a result, what we're seeing in terms of the dollar is a unprecedented run and scarcity. And scarcity becomes problematic when we think about what's going on in Europe, in Japan. And I think that's going to be a big story. Does it limit the degrees of freedom that the central bank of the United States has. If there's a dollar shortage, does it limit the choices that Jerome Powell has? I think it's a result of the choices that Jerome Powell has made, and now we're running up against some of the natural limits. And as monetary policy goes deeper into restrictive space, each incremental hike is going to be more difficult to justify. Let's face it, the Fed has been leading the most recent push higher in global rates, and as a result, the dollar has followed suit. How do you talk about the shortage of dollars that we hear about, the idea that just physically a lot of nations need the physical cash? How much does that pressure the Fed to really open up some lines akin to what we saw in 2020 and that sort of uncomfortable reality of trying to tighten policy while also in effect, loosening in some capacities. Well, it's interesting because there are a number of different ways in which monetary policy in terms of tightening is running up against some of the key constraints. I think another good observation in that regard is the potential for the Treasury Department to start buybacks in the long end of the curve. That seems ostensibly like QE, but in fact, it's just a market functioning move. But there's no question that that's a result of how tight policy has become and how high rates are. 
Do you think that we're actually going to be do doing quantitative tightening come next year in the United States? Uh, selling outside of uh, what is the natural runoff at this point seems as though it should be on the table, if nothing else, certainly in mortgage space. However, that means that we're going to have to see a continued upside surprise in the uh, in the uh, inflation data, as well as a shift from signaling from the Fed. What's the potential concern, though, in the mortgage market, given that mortgages, that the rates have already climbed to above 7% mm -hmm. for the first time going back to 2001, given the fact that you've seen already a rapid deceleration at a record pace in home sales, in even uh, just the valuations, at least the pace of increases, what would that do in terms of creating a broader weakness? So from the Fed's perspective, they're struggling with the fact that the maturities in the mortgage market are not keeping up with the $35 billion cap. And so if they did decide to sell mortgages outright into the market, the implications might intuitively be an increase in the mortgage treasury spread. But in fact, there's a very strong argument to be made that that's largely priced in. And if it were to come to fruition, you might actually see a compression. And I think at the end of the day, right. mortgage rates are going to be far more a function of what's going on in 10 and 30 year yields and the general direction of the overall economy. What's your vision? You write an acclaimed morning note. I'm going to call it extremely dense. It's an extremely thick note. It takes forever to read the two pages. It's so smart. How far out can you look right now? Can you get to Q1? 2023? So in this current environment, I think that what we struggle with in trying to forecast outcomes is the same thing that the Fed struggles with. And that is not only does monetary policy impact markets with a lag, but also given the nature of data collection, we're all largely flying blind because we know that higher real yields is going are going to impact the real economy. The labor market is eventually going to turn. The Fed is eventually going to uh, realize that they have over-tightened at some stage and need to reverse course. The problem is, at this moment, given how low labor force participation is, the unemployment numbers look great. The Fed has more than enough justification to continue hiking rates. But when we look at, for example, yesterday's GDP report, final sales to domestic purchases mm -hmm. ju up just half First a percent. First thing I look for. And that First is, thing I look at every time. As it should be. And that was problematic. It shows we're at stall speed for growth. We're at stall speed for growth, and that limits the degrees of freedom of the Fed. Do you anticipate a shock to all the punditry that's out there, and maybe not even at the November meeting, but at the December meeting? So we're 75, 50, 25 for the next three meetings. I think that's very consensus. The one way I would say that we might differ a bit is we are on board with the soft pivot language, and that being the Fed's going 75, but it's going to be spun somewhat dovishly because they do need to downshift. And so it's going to be very hard. He's auditioning to be on surveillance. Team step down. I mean, he's team step down. Team step down. He sounds like an anchor on, on Bloomberg surveillance. I can have to see any time. A soft pivot. <laughs> How do you feel about me. a happy, private, uh, happy, <laughs> happy Friday? Happy Friday. Yeah. Do you Friday. Friday. <laughs> I don't know what he thinks of that. Ian Ling in there of BMO Capital Markets. Ian, thank you, sir. Just yes. brilliant. Do you know how many hikes we've had this year? Just brilliant. How many hikes, Tom, from Michael Hartnett and the team at Bank of America? Yeah, it's a big number. 243 this is like worldwide, adding them rate hikes thus far in 22. They said that's basically one rate hike every single trading day. They go on to say, and I think this is the important part of their analysis, is that the bond market is now pivoting from inflation to recession, and that with the BOE, the RBA, the BOC <coughs> policy blinking, if you want to call it that, their words, right. their quote, it means a Q4 bear hug, risk asset rally, but their ultimate conclusion, we say a recession shock is a new high in credit spreads and a new low in equities. And the time horizon they have for that is the Q1, Q1 of 2023. And really, Mike Wilson, Lisa, from Morgan Stanley, basically took the same time period with us, didn't he? He said Q1, 23, that's when this bear market might be ending. And how much does that have to do with earnings capitulation? We're seeing a bit of it. The implication is it's not all been <clears> baked <throat> in, that there's going to be further pain that they're going to express. The visibility just isn't there, though, for them to do it right now. Someone wrote into us on Twitter. They want to know, I'm curious, how will we all dress for Monday's Halloween show on Bloomberg Surveillance. Well, how are we going to do this? I said QT t-shirts. No, available all good spirit Halloween shirt. stores. <laughs> we could practicing do, for we Halloween. Could do <laughs> Chairman Powell, Governor yeah. Bailey, and President Lagarde. I won't say who's going to be who, 
but we that we could work that out. I, you know, I, I had you a could failure do President last Lagarde. year. That might work I, out. It, I talked. I, I met with uh, Ms. Lagarde at the IIF, and I said, "Is it okay?" And I, I said, "I can do the you know the beautiful gray hair thing." She mm. said, "Oh, Tom, yes." Keep keep digging, keep digging. I went as Harry Kane last year, and it didn't work out. No, there were what, what was the party? That, I didn't go to that party. No, it was just trick or treating with afterthought. You know, oh. I went as Harry. This year, I'm going as a swap line. A swap line. <laughs> as a swap line. <laughs> my son, my son is going as a whoopee cushion. So there you go. That's kind is of that, is that actually what he's doing? Is that what he's doing? It's too big. No, that yes, was, no, that no, would, no, don't do that. Would, don't come <laughs> round to mine because that would legit scare the hell out of me, okay? <laughs> Coming up, 8.30 Eastern, Lindsay Piexa as Steve Hall. Looking forward to that from New York City for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Elon Musk is cleaning house at Twitter. He's completed his $44 billion acquisition of the company. And Bloomberg's learned he's gotten rid of the CEO and other major executives. Musk plans to be Twitter's chief executive for now. He also intends to do away with permanent bans on users, a category that includes former President Trump. In a new Bloomberg survey, economists predict the Fed will keep laying the groundwork for interest rates to reach 5% by next March. They expect that is likely to trigger a U.S. and global recession. Next week, economists see policymakers raising rates by 75 basis points for a fourth consecutive meeting. A new danger is being posed by climate change. That's according to U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. She spoke to the EU's Sustainable Investment Summit today. Last year, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, for the first time identified climate change as an emerging threat to the financial stability of the United States. Agencies have already taken steps to start incorporating climate-related financial risks into their activities. Yellen also said the war in Ukraine is highlighting the risk of dependence on fossil fuels. And Jeff Bezos could see as much as $23 billion erased from his fortune after Amazon predicted a sluggish holiday quarter. If shares continue to fall, his loss would be the fifth largest one-day decline in wealth on record. That's according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Now, if it holds, Bezos would be worth about $111 billion, nearly half as much of his $214 billion peak in July 2021. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think there is ample evidence that there is lower inflation in the pipeline. But it's not in the headline figures yet, and I don't think the Fed is prepared to blink when they're barely over their neutral policy rate estimate and inflation at a headline level is still high. That's the pushback from Gene Tenuto of Columbia Threadneedle. Always great to hear from him. Here's the price action for you this Friday morning as we close out the trading week. Looking for a week of gains, but what a volatile week we've had. And what damage we've seen beneath the surface on some big tech players within the S&P, down four tenths on the S&P 500. If you're looking for a move on Amazon this morning, we're still down, still lower on the stock in the pre-market. Apple just about holding on. Yields are higher by seven or eight basis points on a 10-year, trying to reclaim a four-handle. Did that briefly a little bit earlier, Lisa. Four, three ninety nine seventy eight, just short of four right now. It's just amazing to see some of the uh, push-pull and how much things are fluctuating. Can we find some real stability in markets if you have this kind of rate volatility? I don't understand I that. I don't <laughs> think you can. Yeah. How many times have we said it around this table? If you can't price the risk-free asset, how do you price risk? And pricing a risk-free asset right now, Tom's well, really hard. Yeah, and the headline here is the risk-free asset is back. As Taleb says, the gravity's back, and that's what everybody's adjusting to. And it's, it's going to be fascinating after the shock of earnings this week, good and bad, how corporations adjust on cost control. That's always the easy path, isn't it? I said it the previous act, and I say it again. It's so strange to see Twitter and then this line next to it acquired by a private investor. Yes, saw that. So Elon Musk has closed the deal. Here are the headlines from Elon Musk. He says he'll dig into users' claims of shadow bans today, Lisa. He's responding to a complaint of Twitter's behaviour. So day one and hitting the ground running 
over at Twitter. You know, I'm curious about the personnel, and we've already seen the CEO leave. We've already seen uh, a number of other chief executives leave. How much are we going to see uh, some of the other talent stay, given the rumors of 75 percent cuts that he pushed back? But still, nonetheless, how do you run a company with such turmoil and a lack of a sense of where things are going? Tom, it's going to be fascinating to see what this guy does with this company. It is. It's going to be fascinating. It, it, it's, a, it's original, uh, to say the least. Also fascinating in the election of the United States. And we will see that in two weeks. Before that, another rather large election. This, of course, in Brazil. It is a massively polarized Brazil. Our Sherry Ann is there in Sao Paulo, and she joins us uh, this morning. Sherry, the distinction here of getting to an October 30 election, what will you study in the coming two days? We are watching right now the poll numbers very closely because, Tom, of course, we have seen a massive underestimation of Bolsonaro's performance when it came to the first round of elections earlier this month. So now the key question is, in a country where you cannot rely on posters, what do you watch? Well, really, they're trying to account for no-shows because Lula tends to get hurt when abstention rates are high. His base of support really coming from low-income voters that are more likely not to show up. So we are now seeing when it comes to Datafolia, the latest numbers that uh, Lula's lead has actually widened to 53 percent, which is higher from last right. week, which is really interesting because <clears throat> this week Bolsonaro's momentum is fading. Is the public engaged? We've got a massive turnout in the United States for a midterm election. We all know the history of the U.S. presidential election. How much are the people of Brazil engaged? There is a depolarization here in Brazil. And of course, when we talk about Latin American politics, we're not really necessarily talking about right and left, which of course have defined lots of elections around the country this year. But it's really about pushing back against the establishment in a way. So we have seen that engagement quite low in the first round, Tom, one of the lowest voter turnouts, about 20 percent, the lowest since we've seen in the 1980s. But right now, everything is getting heated. We have seen even violence last weekend with one of Bolsonaro's allies getting into a gun battle with police. So there is a lot of interest right now on the ground. Sherry, you mentioned that it's more anti-establishment than it is normal uh, party lines in the same kind of way. And this isn't just Brazil. We're seeing this around the world, including in the U.S. and elsewhere. How much do you see this stemming or being exacerbated by the economic place that we're all in, and Brazil as well, at a time when people do feel like they are being unfairly penalized by inflation? They're not able to keep pace. How much is that the undercurrent of this polarization for anti-establishment and, and trying to, to keep the status quo a bit more? It has been a really interesting few months, Lisa, because as we were coming to this election, not surprisingly, President Bolsonaro tried to ramp spending, really extending those social welfare packages for low-income voters, trying to lure Lula's uh, support base uh, to his camp. Lula, on the other side, has been really emphasizing the economic prosperity during his two terms in office since 2003. Of course, a caveat was that he was enjoying really a huge commodities boom. But that has been really the undercurrent. Perhaps a silver lining in Brazil. Remember, the central bank here has been aggressively tightening, preemptively tightening. They're right now holding rates steady. So what does this mean? Perhaps a good economic uh, mix for Brazil where you have higher rates, you have uh, commodities exporting industries uh, that can really withstand perhaps the higher yields globally that we're seeing right now. Hey, Sherry, thank you. Wonderful reporting. Sherry on there on the ground in Brazil. To Sherry's point, and I hate it when the Fed says front-loading, and I'm guilty of using their language too. This wasn't front-loading from the Fed. It was catch-up from the Fed. Yeah. The front-loaders, the people that actually went first, were in EM. And Brazil was one of them when they hiked rates in early 2021. And they experienced the pain as a result. And you're sure. seeing some of the social unrest as a result of some of both the policies, but more importantly, the economic backdrop. What Sherry is talking about is incredibly important because this highlights a wave of populism that will only be exacerbated by the current emotion that we're in. So how does that affect politics at a time when you've got your fiscal hands tied, you've got monetary hands tied, you've got people who are getting increasingly angry? These elections are going to matter that much more. Have you seen where rates are in Brazil, Tom? Just south of 14%. That's insane. Yeah. It, it, These are big numbers. And, and the currency's actually done better than many, many others, maybe because they were early, like you say. It speaks to that. But, and I defer to Mr. Sassauer on this, but I'm sorry, the Brazilian paper or the dollar paper in Brazil, those numbers are unsustainable. I mean, it's just 
There's just no way. Well, the dollar issue is clearly a big one, Tom. You talked about with Ian Lingen on a, on a different topic. But the dollar issue worldwide, Lisa, it's the number one thing. I think if you ask a central banker abroad what they want right now, if they could get a wish, yes, inflation lower, but also a part of that feature, just a weaker dollar, please. A weaker dollar, less pressure from the Federal Reserve. This could help them at the same time at some point. And this is really the tension. I was speaking with about uh, that with Peter Shear. He expects the dollar to be the pivot point for the Fed because the pain outside will become unsustainable and the pressures will be quite significant. And I wonder, not only on an economic level as we see the currency uh, headwinds to some of the companies here, but also on a political one, given that other nations are going to see these uprisings in the face of some of the pain. Japan did nothing overnight, right? <laughs> Policy unchanged? Of course. Yeah. Didn't they can hold on for Governor Kuroda's term for the next several months? A lot of it depends on the dollar, right? If the dollar starts to weaken a plateau, they get a reprieve. It'd be amazing if they can hand on, Tom. Just hang on to yield curve I, control through this volatility. You know, you're talking I, I, about. you bring it up, and I don't want to get mathy here on a happy Friday, but um, uh, the bottom line is I did a 30 year study of yen dynamics, and the answer, excuse me, of, of, of inflation dynamics in Japan. And three times before, they brought it up to a 3% inflation. John, boom. Every time it comes back down. Did you just blend the two things? I did. A happy Friday. Did. did you like what I did with the in Lingo and FRA OIS? I, that was happy great. Happy Friday OIS. Okay. Can't do that with Libra OIS. That works OIS. on a south side. That's a great note. That's a great title for a note. Yeah. You should publish. Happy FRA you OIS. You should publish that 30 year study that. of CPI in Japan. Yeah. Equity futures down a half of 1%. This is Bloomberg. The ECB does have to remind itself and remind markets, I should say, that its primary ethos is to control inflation. We don't think that the ECB will reach restrictive territory before the start of 2023. The global economy is looking very soft at the moment. Inflation will probably be staying sticky and high, and companies will pass some of that through. There is lower inflation in the pipeline, but it's not in the headline figures yet, and I don't think the Fed is prepared to blink. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen. We welcome you on a Friday on radio, on television. We welcome you to double digit inflation, no, not food inflation in the United States. John Farrell, Germany joins Italy. This is ugly. 11 handle for CPI in Germany year over year, 11.6% on CPI and we've got a big turn of events in this bond market too. Yesterday a major rally, yields lower today, big sell off, yields up at the front end of the curve Tom in Germany, the two year up 17 basis points. My problem with this is really really smart people thinking really really hard are undershooting the trend everywhere and you wonder if that's going to be in the United States as well. We've said it a few times, we keep talking about peak inflation Tom, if it's in our past in America, is it still in our future? in Europe because that inflation number is getting worse. We had this conversation yesterday about the ECB having some kind of step down. Let's talk about how difficult it is for this European Central Bank this week. 75 basis point hike, CPI in Germany with an 11 handle and Lisa, PMIs in the 40s. That is the central banker's dilemma. Downside risk to growth, upside risk to inflation. What on earth do you do with interest rates? Especially at a time when you did not get the worst case scenario come to fruition or weather has been somewhat mild. You haven't seen uh, those stockpiles of natural gas come down as much as they had feared. And still inflation is coming in harder than people expected, even with lower prices. You wonder, Tom, how this is going to play out, well, considering that the ECB is going to try to crack down and we do have a lag. Effect. Bring it over to the United States, John. Two days. Halloween. I'm going as a swap line on Tuesday. November 1, ISM manufacturing survey is 50.0 and a 49 handle there again is that tendency. We'll see if we start to get that downturn in America, Tom. You saw those right. subtle hints of that in the GDP report <clears throat> yesterday. Many people did. Well, OK, I, I, I take the point here that, the, again, Chris Lowe is outstanding on this of a really fragile uh, GDP report. But here this morning, bringing it over to earnings, forget about Twitter and all that theater, there's some good earnings out there, but everyone focused on big tech dealing with inflation, sure. dealing with the dynamics of dollar. Well, they're focused on big tech because that's where the weighting is. That's <clears> where the power is. The big weighting's in a market cap weighted S&P 500. You look elsewhere at Energy, Exxon, Chevron, 
crushing gear through the right. year. And today on the quarter, Tom, great numbers. What do we hear from President Biden and Lisa today? You've talked to Anne Marie and others here. I mean, does the administration get out front here in full election panic? Well, they probably will. They'll probably say that this Bad is going to need to uh, really get their investments up, that it isn't as significant <clears throat> as it could be. But what's it actually going to do, given that we have two weeks? Two weeks till the election, right. and, you know, it's not clear what they can do. David Costin with us here in a moment. Let's get through the data, John, very quickly. I'm going to do yen quickly here. Backs up off BOJ, uh, 147.51. Round it up, 148. Where is that statistic Sunday, 7 p.m.? Did you just say Bad Exxon as if Exxon was a dog's name? Yeah. Bad Exxon. Well, the president's going to go Bad Exxon. Did you not notice Bad that? Exxon. <laughs> bad Exxon. <laughs> bad Exxon. <laughs> Bad total. Is that what the president's going to do? He's going to come out and say bad exile. Sit. How dare yeah. you make money? Sit. Sit. <laughs> and they're, and Just they're stop get, it. Off the election, they're going to get crushed in Washington because they're going to go up there. They're going to be there, you know, I promise to sell the truth, the whole truth. And they're going to go you're, project you're, you're by killing project me. through you're what killing they're doing. Get to Costin before he runs away. <laughs> do the data here before Costin's waiting for a data check. already. Futures are down by about five tenths of one percent. The bond market right. yields are higher by nine basis points. They're higher in Europe. <clears> that CPI print from Germany's up. David Costin, Goldman Sachs, joins us this morning. David, can you explain to me how your world has changed from when I studied 3 to 4% FX adjustment on equities, and all of a sudden we're doing dollar adjustment of 6%, 8%, and the CFO of Apple said near 10% yesterday. How does your world change with strong dollar? Well, the way the world uh, changes from a fundamental point here in the United States is that 70% of the revenues of US companies are actually generated domestically. Uh, so therefore, the sensitivity of companies from a corporate point of view is largely gonna be focused in the technology sector, where almost 60% of their sales were overseas. So from that point of view, Tom, the translation back is really gonna be focused in, in certain areas as opposed to broadly across the market. When you look at the sales of uh, healthcare companies, utilities, and the telecom companies, even financials, largely domestic in nature, and therefore it's less sensitive than maybe is widely perceived. But it is definitely a concern and a focus on some of the global uh, multinationals, tech in particular. David, let's talk about buybacks. This came from Market Insider yesterday. Listen to these numbers. Meta spent $45 billion on buybacks last year, paying about three thirty dollars a share on average. Meta yesterday closed with a 97 handle. David Costin, what on earth is going to happen with corporate buybacks in a year to come? And just walk us through, because I know you and the team at Goldman do so much work on this, the importance of buybacks as a feature of demand in this equity market. So, Jonathan, a critical point is the fact that over the last 10 years, every year, the single biggest source of demand for U.S. shares has been corporate repurchases. So question here is this year, they'll be up around 5 percent versus a year ago. And our forecast next year is they'll probably decline by about 10 percent. So 10 percent less buybacks in 2023 than this year. That's assuming a soft landing. Jonathan, if you had a recession scenario, that's probably down 40 percent. That is, again, a very significant development in, the, in terms of the confidence the CEOs have in the outlook for you know, business activity in, in, the, in the coming year. That does drive some of their decisions on their capital spending. I've uh, spoken to some boards this week as they think about their uses of cash in the coming 12 months, the idea of how important capital spending is relative to research and development dollars, how do they think about the prioritization of merger and acquisition spending. But buybacks has been the default uh, use of cash for a lot of companies, and that is likely to be receding as we look into calendar 2023. And that, again, has been the single biggest uh, support function for equity prices in, uh, in the last 10 years. David, just to sort of underline this point, how much do you expect this to pull back in terms of how much stocks can gain just simply because this massive buyer will not be there? Well, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a big issue. When we think about the flow of funds, if you want to think about it in that context, Lisa, the idea of uh, pension funds as countercyclical buyers would be one area of, of source of demand partially offsetting some of the uh, we will pulling back on the on the buybacks but it is uh, it's tough tough to basically replace that when uh, when looking at companies spending around 3.1 trillion dollars that's the cash spending of S&P 500 companies 3.1 trillion uh, this year probably flat in terms of overall spending for next year and uh, and the uh, corporate buybacks roughly a trillion dollars uh, this year, and that's likely to be down probably closer to 900 billion uh, in, the, in the next year. There's really not another source of demand for shares that is gonna replace 
the the bid, if you will, from the corporate side. David, one thing that Goldman Sachs has been out front on is that you don't think that there has been full earnings capitulation in terms of what we can expect going forward. What do you think the trigger will be to sort of throw the kitchen sink uh, at the issue and really see the downgrades to outlook that you would like to see to see a bottom? Well, uh, just to be clear, Lisa, it's not like I would like to see them. And what do we expect to happen? Uh, I think the point you made is an excellent one. And the following, keep the following kind of numbers in mind. Coming into the first quarter, the expectation was about plus 5% year over year earnings growth, came in plus 12. Second quarter, expectation plus six, came in plus 10. The setup coming in for the current quarter was basically plus three. Uh, expectation year over year growth, earnings plus 3%. They're basically somewhere between one and 2%. So there's actually a, you know, a, a negative or surprises relative to expectations. That's right now. What's happened then looking forward in the fourth quarter expectations kind of at this time, you know, uh, before the earnings season began was plus seven. Now it's looking at plus five. So the idea of this cut, cut, cuts or a death by a thousand cuts, that's essentially what's happening as you look into the fourth quarter and then more importantly, as you look into calendar 2023. Our expectations right now are basically plus 3% earnings growth. So basically a modest growth, nominal dollars uh, help sales, higher inflation, bad for margins. So you basically have very modest level of profits. That's assuming a uh, soft landing or basically the economy continues to grow, although at uh, low, below trend pace. On the other hand, if you have a recession, which more and more and more of the portfolio managers with whom I speak uh, have that view, and then basically you'd have earnings probably down 11%. So that's your starting point. And Lisa, the point is that currently expectations <clears throat> in next year is probably plus seven. So think in terms of the magnitude of diminution in terms of the cuts, probably pl pl coming from plus seven down to potentially as, as low as, uh, as minus 11%. And that historically has been the case coming into a recession, sort of the period of six months ahead of recessions, earnings usually get cut by around 10%. So a lot of focus has been the impact of higher, you know, Tom made reference earlier, the dollar, the impact of higher inflation. What does this do? Can companies, you know, support their margins? The answer is there's downward pressure. The source of the negative surprises this quarter has been, in fact, weaker margins than was anticipated. David Costin and Goldman. David, one of the best. Just fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Enjoy the weekend. David Costin there of Goldman yeah. Sachs. TK, what a week. It's been fascinating. We talked about the equal weight and the outperformance there, the outperformance yeah. of small caps as well this week too. The equal weight S&P up every single day this week, even I, with that tech I, carnage. I'm going to go back. We, you know, I'm as guilty of this as anyone. We are completely fixated on 20. Is it indeed now 30% of market cap? Sure. Caterpillar. I mean, it's in CFA level one. It's one of the two major accounting companies you use. Nobody talks about it. Well, that's they the point. It. That's why I keep bringing up they the equal it. weight. If you strip out the muscle... The market cap waiting <clears throat> on the S&P 500, yeah. those big tech players, Lisa, yeah. that hasn't been bleeding this week in a major way. This is the push-pull between people expecting the Fed to not raise yeah. rates as much. Can that's providing some tailwind to that and then the others, right. which are getting hit by the earnings. We should do a photo for uh, Halloween. For What's radio. the photo This off? really works out. This is a number of years ago from a gentleman who works at the Cleveland Fed. And he did this to his three sons. What is it? And it's just, uh, they're going to bring it up here. There it is. Look at them. He dressed his three sons up. They all as went as you. King for that's, Halloween. that's terrifying. It's terrifying. I bet it's they abuse. A, I bet they got a lot of candy that week, Tom. Look at that. They look happy, though. Good morning to three ha cherubs. They look Tom. happy. Are you <laughs> saying they've done a bad impression? <laughs> Are you saying that's a bad impression of Tom because they look happy? <laughs> What's good Thank about you, Lisa. <laughs> so much love. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, Cleveland. Gotta love that. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Elon Musk has begun putting a stamp on Twitter. The world's richest person closed his $44 billion takeover of the platform and has begun firing major executives. Bloomberg's learned Musk plans to assume the role of CEO. He also plans to do away with permanent bans on users, a category that includes former President Trump. Volkswagen has cut it back its sales expectations for the year. Europe's biggest car maker now sees deliveries on par with last year. VW is still being ham hammer hampered by the availability of chips and logistics remain a challenge. We are living in uh, challenging times with uh, numerous um, global crises um, and um, the supply chain issue is one of those. What we have shown um, during um, the last months with our financial um, robustness that we will be prepared for the future.
Meanwhile, VW says it's struggling to keep up with the demand for electric vehicles. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. season is here. The earnings are starting to pour in. The numbers are holding up better than expected. Sorry, business isn't all that bad. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Netflix earnings going across the wire. A big beat. The stock is up more than 8%. Coming in stronger than their rivals. With exclusive expert analysis. Finally back to growth. The mother of all opportunities. What is the industry to watch? That's where the rubber hits the road for Goldman Sachs. It's going to be a really interesting earnings season. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. The big issue here, guys, is, and, and it's really a mess. The Fed is raising rates into a his, in a historic way into a generationally levered system based on debt to GDP. Inventories have spiked and demand is, is weak. That is not the formula for, wow, let's go out and buy stocks because it's about to get good. Love catching up with Tony Dwyer. Tony Dwyer, they're the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity. <clears throat> Looking at the equity market right now on the S&P 500, futures down by about a half of 1%. The story of the week, the story of the year, the performance of the new economy versus the performance of the old economy. Amazon is down in the pre-market by more than 13%. Chevron is up by a little more time than 2%. Yeah, those are the changes. Can we go to Dwyer there? Of course who, you can. Who, who was phenomenal. Always it's is. staying in the market, and he kept saying, until there's a recession, until there's a recession, and he's amended his tone as we get there. Because he believes it's coming, yeah. Tom. Yeah. And the GDP performance <clears throat> yesterday, yes, the headline number might have looked okay, but beneath the surface, yeah. there were some concerns. I just love these people that have the courage to be in the market through the thick and thin of all this as well. Right now, I don't know if I have the courage to be on Twitter. We'll have to see how that works out. I'm waiting for Elon to tweet me and block what me do you or mean? whatever he's going to do. What, what are you worried about? I want him to follow me. You know, oh, you want Elon to follow you? Yeah, you know, now okay. that he's a CEO. And, and get you some more followers. Is yeah. that what it's about? Ed Ludlow with us right now on Mr. Musk and Twitter. Ed, I want to go to a financial aspect before we get to the cultural uh, moment. This is at eight times sales there's yeah. reports of 200 million plus to the executives exiting as well. Frame for our audience how absurd eight times sales is. Yeah, he's overpaying for this company, right? This is a 44 billion deal. Okay, there are co-investors on the equity side and there's a debt proportion. Servicing that debt is a really big concern and there's a lot of great reporting on the Bloomberg about this. It's a 54% premium of where Twitter was valued at the beginning of the year. And they are going to have to spend anywhere from 100 million to 200 million uh, on severance and then the unvested equity for the C-suite, which all walked out the building last night and are not coming back. Um, this is a stock that in its public market life trailed the S&P 500 uh, and the NASDAQ 100 every year since it went public. So right. Musk kind of realizes that he's buying this with risk. But look at what he said yesterday. He put out that public statement saying, oh, actually, I realize advertising is the core of this, this business. Who, who does he bring gonna... in to replace all these bodies going out the door? According to sources, he brings in himself. He oh, appoints himself. Yeah. He appoints himself as chief executive officer at the interim. I reported yesterday with Kurt Wagner that he brought a small army of Tesla engineering talent into the building just off Market Street. He sat, buddied them up with their corresponding Twitter engineering talent, sat them down and made them wade through the code which powers the, the Twitter platform so he can understand how the code works. This is the level of micromanagement that Musk has at Tesla and that he has at SpaceX. This isn't surprising. This is what happens every day across all his companies. He takes control. And actually, the names that are working behind the scenes at SpaceX, other than Gwyn Shotwell or Drew Baglino at Tesla, they're unknown because they don't have public-facing profiles. And Musk takes not just the public-facing responsibilities of those firms, but he also micromanages on the product side too.
So I've been informed that I'm going to go as Tom Keen uh, for Halloween, and so I have to ask unfair questions that. and do sort of uh, the Tom Keen impression. So unfair question. What does this mean for Tesla that Elon Musk is going to be spending so much time over at Twitter trying to reconfigure something, and it doesn't seem like there is this sort of synergy between the two? Yeah. I, I, throughout the week, the market... Tesla retail investors, Tesla fans, and institutionals that I spoke to were bracing for Elon Musk to sell more Tesla stock to fund the deal. That's part one. There's an element of key man risk, which the four of us have been talking about for months, that Elon Musk is distracted. But I think that when the news came out from Bloomberg that Musk would install himself as CEO, I heard from a lot of people that are concerned because they do want him to focus on Tesla, which faces supply chain challenges um, and also has to sort of be strategic about it, how it's pricing its vehicles in the face of a global slowdown. He is micromanaging and fully involved in the future of SpaceX and his bigger picture goals of getting mankind to Mars. There's a lot of concern that he can't do it all, um, but also that he's not able to accept, according to sources, this is a concern, his own limitations. He doesn't necessarily have the skill set to run a social media company. And so there are questions about who he'd bring in. I'm actually hearing from sources and Twitter insiders, they actually want Jack Dorsey to come back. Interesting. And the reason that they do is that he has a good relationship with Elon Musk, but Jack Dorsey, in the meantime, can sort of glue together the <laughs> fractions within inside that building. Remember, this is a company that has 7,500 employees. Right. It's not even that many in the context of global mega cap tech stocks that have hundreds of thousands of employees. So, you know, that's what I'm hearing on the ground, at least. Uh, just real quick here, what is the regulatory oversight at a time when this really is the billboard, the sort of global billboard that so many people use to get their news? Yeah, well, I think we've already heard from Thierry Breton, right, the markets commissioner in Europe, who says, in our market, we control how Twitter flies. In other words, you know, he sent out a warning that whatever happens on a policy standpoint and how Twitter operates, it has to operate within the, the laws of the jurisdictions in which users use it. Musk has said that on the free speech issue. He wants to support free speech and allow the widest range of voices possible. But he's also been clear, to be fair, that if you say something, it has to be legal within the jurisdiction that you yourself as a user are operating with. But we do expect that to be a conversation, not just in Europe, but globally. And then there's the backward looking. Do regulators look about at how this deal came about? How Musk first disclosed his stake and how we got to this point, how the two sides communicated with one another. There's lots of reporting out there that both the SEC and FTC are already looking at these points. They're going to be busy potentially. Ed, thank you. Ed Ludlow. There on the West Coast, there's the tweet from Elon Musk just moments ago. Bramo, let the good times roll over at Twitter. Chief Twit, let the good times roll. What did he say, free bird? Here we go uh, with Elon Musk. And what kind of leader he'll be is unclear. What free speech means will be, once again, very much in the forefront as he talks about removing some of the bans on people like Donald Trump. And, and where do the moderators go? I mean, I guess he outbid it at eight times sales. But you just wonder why some ginormous company didn't come in and buy this up almost as a research project, but I guess they well, got Well, you said it, price, right? They get price, they it, got Who wants bid. to put that price up? Yeah. Elon Musk eventually himself, by all suggestions, didn't want to pay that price, but he's had to. I've heard a lot of people say that Elon Musk has had success where there are engineering problems, and this isn't an engineering problem. I think that kind of forgets that I he is a marketing really machine. Well he's also a marketing, he's a machine, marketing machine, though, machine. Yes. Tom, and that's kind of what you need at Twitter. Well, although there is the sort of technical issue of algorithms that could potentially weed out some of the bots and other issues that people face on Twitter. It's funny, I just never thought this deal would close. I, I know, so nobody, did. The, nobody did. The whole way but when so it came to the financing, people. the debt. The shares but are up Elon so much Musk this year. my DMs? Probably, yeah. He's probably reading them right now. You better be careful. Boy, am I in trouble. <laughs>
to three ninety nine seventy eight. <laughs> Look at those data. <laughs> hey, can I get out of here? <laughs> Look at this data. So let's get to the ECI. The Fed talks about how important it is. The employment cost index one point two percent in line with the survey of one point two. The previous read one point three. Let's look at personal income and personal spending. Personal income at 0.4 in line for the month of September at 0.4. Personal spending 0.6. So that's punchy relative to an estimate of 0.4. The PCE deflator year over year 6.2 percent. Survey 6.3. PCE core deflator year over year. Lisa 5.1. The survey 5.2. Yeah. So this actually is on the margins. <clears throat> good, right? So this is actually coming in at a lower pace. And ECI coming in line is actually impressive, considering the fact that the likes of Citigroup's Andrew Hollenhorst was expecting 1.3 percent and said that really it does highlight this wage spiral. How much do we stop hearing about that since we're not necessarily hearing about this sort of acceleration? Hard to get a real read on how the market's responding to this in the bond market, because we're seeing yields really kick higher over in Europe. And we're seeing a similar move in sympathy in the United States. So Treasury yields right now, as things stand at the front end, up six basis points to four. 33 on a two-year. Tom, just looking at the Italian move, up yeah. 20 basis points. Similar moves over in Germany. Inflation out of Germany this morning with an 11 handle. And, and Tom, the duration of it. There's, there's none of this transitory stuff. I'm not hearing anything transitory no, 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 out no, no. of any of the countries over there. We'll touch on that uh, in a moment. I do want to point out, John, uh, you, you, know, you look at everything here, and I've got some dollar strength, and I really wonder, where's the dollar a week from now? After True. this dollar pullback. It's going into the Fed decision next week. That's yeah. come quick, hasn't it, that Fed decision? <clears throat> yes, it has. And I actually looked at the data that they will ha get being data dependent to the inflation data, which sure. you brought up earlier in the week. And they just get a ton of data getting out to November 10th. Payrolls on Friday, yeah. next Friday, and then the week after, November 10th, we get CPI again. And a lot of, let's just say with Bloomberg on radio and television this morning, 10 a.m., the Michigan statistics, which are of value. The Michigan statistics are particularly of value if you're uh, waited to the, the Midwest, as Lindsay Piegas is, out of Northwestern, uh, and, of course, with Stiefel, and she's their chief economist and joins us in studio today, which is a, an honor from the Midwest. What's the Midwest economy like compared to... Uh, people on the East Coast working in three zip codes. What do we get wrong in our silly focus on Manhattan? I, I think we're missing the compounding level of pain that we're seeing across the country. We are seeing small businesses, we are seeing consumers very much under pressure as a result right. of rising costs. We're seeing businesses struggle to stay afloat. They're facing rising rental costs, rising parts costs. Uh, it's a very difficult environment, and right. sometimes we do focus just on the microcosm of some of these major cities that may be faring slightly better, but the rest of the country okay. is still under an extreme amount of I'm going to rip pain. up the script right now. We're going to get uh, Dr. Piggs in trouble with her general counsel at Stiefel right now. Let's go political. <laughs> There's an election coming up in a couple of weeks. I just mentioned food inflation of 11.2 percent. Does that sustain, as John Farrow talks about, German inflation sustaining? Well, I think right now the the risk to inflation in the U.S. is certainly to the upside. The idea that we're going to see this welcome downward trajectory, as the Fed has so predicted. So, what's your x-axis on double-digit food inflation? You know, in the I, next year? I, absolutely. I think carrying into 2023, I think this could absolutely be a 2024 event as well. That we're continuing to see these contagion effects in the agriculture market, in the energy sector, and this is going to make it very difficult for the Fed to get inflation back down to their 2% target. And remember, even when we look at the Bloomberg estimates uh, on, uh, across the past several years, the market is consistently underestimating the level of inflation by anywhere from 50 to 150 basis points. And so this is an ongoing theme. Well, although some people would argue that we're also underestimating on the flip side how quickly it could come down and that we are seeing things like used cars, we're seeing housing prices start to stabilize or even in certain places come down. We're starting to see this feeling that perhaps we're not going to get that acceleration in some of the main components that have been driving this. What do you say to them that perhaps they're missing the forest for the trees with respect to some of the other price pressures coming from wages in other areas? Well, we are seeing demand destruction in some areas, which I do think will translate into slower cost pressures in some sectors. But at this point, when we're still talking about an unemployment rate at a five-decade low, contributing to that upward pressure on wages, coupled with the idea that it's not just a demand side 
inflation equation. It's also a supply side inflation equation. And there, the Fed has very little control over these factors. So I've been watching spending figures, and consumers are still spending. We saw that GDP print yesterday, and that surprised to the upside, consumer uh, consumption. How much is this being driven by borrowed money? by credit cards. We're seeing debt on credit cards climb to the highest levels that they've been going back to 2019. This is kind of a perilous time to be accelerating leverage, no? Well, to your point, consumers are still spending, but it is very clearly that second derivative decline, meaning a slower pace of still positive expenditures. We're talking about sub-2% consumption levels. That's far from impressive. But we're also seeing very temporary factors helping support the consumer. We did see lower prices at the pump over the past couple of months. We have seen consumers turn to credit cards. And while I'm certainly not advocating that consumers take on new amounts of debt, we do have quite a bit of wiggle room for consumers to expand their balance sheet. We are starting from a relatively healthy standpoint when we look at debt relative to disposable personal income. That's at a multi-decade low. So we do have additional room to continue to supplement these lower levels of spending for another month, two, maybe longer, at which point many are optimistic there'll be additional fiscal stimulus coming down the pipeline to help those in a position of unemployment or in a position of hardship. Next week, November 2nd, Wednesday. Can't believe it's November next week. I know. Ridiculous. Anyway, Federal Reserve meeting, Chairman Powell in the news conference, given everything you've just said, and given the hopes of dreams of this step down that I keep hearing about, we all keep hearing about over the last week, how does he navigate that conversation given everything you've just said? I, I think he says at some point it will be appropriate to slow the pace of rate increases and assess the earlier impact of policy decisions. We're not at that point yet, but at some point that will be appropriate. That will give the committee enough wiggle room to continue at a more aggressive pace. And we do expect the Fed to maintain this aggressive pace into the end of the year and even revise higher their forecast for rates and inflation. But it also gives them enough wiggle room on the other side that should inflation surprise to the downside, they could begin to look at a more benign 50 basis point increase steps. Scott, five years. You had the honor of Robert Gordon economics at Northwestern. That book he wrote a number of years ago on the collapse of economic growth in America was gloomy, gloomy, gloomy. <laughs> Is he on to something here, or can technology save the American economy out five years? It's going to be a big question mark about productivity. Productivity has been languishing in this country for the better part of the past decade at about half a percent. So when we look at the growth prospects of the U.S. economy, signs of return of productivity, I think the long-run potential is below 2 percent, probably around 1.8 percent. So without that influx of productivity, without that boost, I, I do think it's a more dismal uh, long-term potential for the U.S. economy. Still positive, but certainly not robust. Lindsay, we're going to leave it there. Fantastic to catch up with you. Thank Lindsay you. Lindsay there of Stiefel. On the look ahead to November 2nd, next November next week. I just, how quickly is What are you going as for Halloween? Somebody emailed and said, what's Pharaoh going as? I thought we were mixing it up. We were going to put Chairman Powell's name in a hat, President Lagarde's name in a hat, oh, Governor the, Bailey. No, no, I'm going no you don't line. get to choose. And then you pick a name from a hat, and that's who you get to dress up as. Fabulous. I'm completely I'm sure your local spirit Halloween will stock those outfits. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. The present Lagarde suit. Lindsay Piegzo with Michael Faroli at J.P. Morgan. These are stunning run rates for the American economy. Nobody, including any of the sure. politicians, are set up for a sub-2% run rate. I was just looking at core PCE for next year. So ECFC, the function on the Bloomberg, because Lindsay mentioned some of the estimates out there. 5% for 22 3.4% for 23 and 2024. The median estimate right now, Lisa, is 2.3%. If you want to look at CPI, 8% for 22, 4.1 for 23, 2024, 2.5%. That's the glide path, the consensus view for the glide path for inflation through the next couple of years. I'm wondering what Diane Swank would call that. I'm suspecting she, her, that she might... Her word might, is fanciful, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, fanciful. I think that she might have an impression about this as well. How do we get there that quickly, given some of the pressures? And, and the theme of the morning, as you put out, about the old economy versus the new economy and the old economy waging revenge on the new economy of tech, right, the oil, the gas, that's not going away. So how much is that going to be a persistent pressure? Well, just to reaffirm how bad I am at this, if you'd said to me 12 months ago that we'd still had COVID zero in China, I would not have guessed that we could have this sustainable rally that we've had in the commodity market. Of course, Ukraine and the war with Russia has been a big, big problem in that. I get it. But the fact that we have had this massive commodity boom without China online, can you imagine how much worse things would be if we didn't have COVID zero okay. in China. You started this by saying 
how bad I am at this. Who's good at that? At having no, a crystal, you know, being able to like predict been, any of this stuff. Uh, Nobody can. Thank right? you for protecting me. I appreciate <laughs> but, it. But it's like no, but it, that's that's part of what's underpinning the incredible volatility. This cycles move really quickly, Bramo. I, I totally agree, and it makes I think any kind of forecast next year, Tom, the size of the asterisk next to that forecast yeah, in every single yeah, annual cool. outlook that comes out in the next <clears> month or so. It's got to be huge. I, I have a fond memory of the certitude of three-year forecasts of economists, gone. Two-year, gone. One year, maybe. Two weeks. No, and, and I'm going to go back to the ECB headlines yesterday, folks. They come out in a stream, the acclaimed Bloomberg headlines, 40, 50 at a time, and none of them were timestamped like Draghi. None of them. What they want, Tom, <clears throat> is to leave forward guidance in the past. What they want is some kind of meeting-by-meeting meeting optionality. The problem they have in places like Europe, Lisa, is that inflation's still running away. Is that really the time to open the door to kind of two-way risk to be introduced back into the market? Because if you offer me one-way risk and you just say keep hiking, that keeps financial conditions tight. If you turn to two-way risk, that doesn't keep me nimble. I'm just thinking, oh, you sound more dovish. Financial well, conditions ease. Yeah. And that's what's taken place over the last month. Until we get the CPI report after sure. the election. And then all of a sudden, perhaps, the 2 a risk becomes more heavily weighted one side, depending on what that shows. We're at the mercy of that. Yeah, we're at the mercy of the in data. In the next couple of weeks. This was fun, guys. Thank you. You're I'm leaving? Gonna go. Yeah, as I always do. Oh. For the next show. <laughs> fun. Next hour is going to be a ton of fun. Hugh Hendry has made the trip over to, from St. Bart's, lucky him, to New York City. The founder and former CIO of Eclectic Asset Management. Super Tom. fun. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. 9.30 Eastern time, coming up from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Elon Musk is cleaning house at Twitter. He's completed his $44 billion acquisition of the company. And Bloomberg's learned he's gotten rid of the CEO and other major executives. Musk plans to be Twitter's chief executive for now. He also intends to do away with permanent bans on users, a category that includes former President Trump. In a new Bloomberg survey, economists predict the Fed will keep laying the groundwork for interest rates to reach 5% by next March. They expect that to likely trigger a U.S. and global recession. Next week, economists see policymakers raising rates by 75 basis points for a fourth consecutive meeting. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is taking no option off the table as he tries to plug a 41 billion budget shortfall. That includes windfall taxes on banks. We asked the CEO of the UK's NatWest Group about that. The UK banking sector is um, already very well taxed. We, we pay two taxes, the bank levy, which is already in place. Um, so we, we, we do contribute from that perspective. We're highly taxed and more taxed than other um, sectors and the financial sector globally. So, um, but it's clearly something that the government may look at. It. Any announcement on taxes is likely to come in the government's so-called autumn statement on November 17th. And Porsche's surging income failed to impress investors. Profits soared 41% at the luxury car maker the first nine months of the year, partly due to the exchange rate effects. But Porsche didn't raise its full year guidance. That suggests the current quarter may be more challenging. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. There's a lot of pressure for companies who are in China, well-established companies like Citi, like JP Morgan, this financials, who need to have a presence because that's the nature of their global business. And if they start getting too pessimistic about China, I think one of the things that's going to happen is that they're going to start getting cut out. Uh, and, and in order to keep their business models going, they have to be um, cheerleaders for the administration. Bill Lee, the Milken Institute, absolutely brilliant on the changes in China here coming off the Party Congress a week ago. Always good to speak to the gentleman from the Milken Institute. This is a joy. He is out of Punahou in the esteemed poli-sci program at Williams College. He did something with an internet company years ago called America Online. And then he was supposed to leave the cushy life. Steve Case chose not to do that. And more than anyone I know in technology, he has gone out and said, from sea to shining sea, how do we do tech? The rise of the rest is a second effort at this. It is a short 
terse book. I can't say enough about it. Uh, rated by the FT in their beauty list this year. Steve Case joins us now on what's going on in Pittsburgh, what's going on in Detroit. Steve, you begin the book with Shinola in Detroit, Michigan. I get Austin. I get Nashville. I get Fargo. Okay, why is Detroit the rise of the rest? Well, the whole book is around dozens of cities, but I start off with Detroit because it's such an amazing story. A hundred years ago, Detroit was sort of the Silicon Valley of its time when the car was the, the technology of the day. Everybody wanted to be part of the car revolution. People moved to Detroit to be part of that. It was going gangbusters for, for several decades and then lost about half its population. And then the year before we came with our Rise Arrest bus, uh, the city of Detroit went bankrupt. Uh, so it was the top city, then it was really struggling, and now it's really fighting its way back. You mentioned Shinola way back. We also went back to another company called StockX. Neither of those companies existed 10 years right. ago. Both of them now have more than 1,000 employees in, in Detroit and are pr creating a new sense of possibility in Detroit. And that's really the story all across the country, which is why I decided to write the book, to tell the stories of these entrepreneurs building companies and these cities that are being renewed because of the work of, of new companies. Is big tech helping in investment in Sioux Falls? Well, there been, has been more of a backlash, as you know, against uh, big tech. That does create some opportunities for some entrepreneurs. Even, frankly, this difficult economy. You've already seen some big companies cut back on some of their initiatives that were kind of long-term growth initiatives. That creates an opening for, for entrepreneurs. And so I believe this next five or 10 years really could be great. Uh, we just need to focus on entrepreneurs everywhere, not just in, in a few places. And for the last decade, 75% of venture capital has gone to just three states. California, New York, and Massachusetts, 75 percent. So the other 47 states are fighting over 25 percent. So the whole idea of Rise the Rest is to back those entrepreneurs. These, they're going to be very successful investments as well as having a very powerful impact in terms of creating jobs and economic vitality in these, in these communities, many of which have felt left out and left behind by this last wave of innovation. What about the next couple of years, considering that there was a lot of ample venture capital available over the past five years? Going forward, a lot less is available. A lot of people are pulling back. There isn't the same kind of free money being thrown in terms of IPOs and a lot less acceptance to highfalutin tech ideas. What do you think that will do to the pace of development? Well, it might make it a little more difficult in Silicon Valley, but it actually likely will help in terms of the rise of the rest. And some of that is because it's always been more difficult for the entrepreneurs in these rising cities to get venture capital. Valuations have tended to be lower. The entrepreneurs have tended to be more scrappier, more bootstrappy, more capital efficient. Uh, so this change in the market where some of the high flyers in places like Silicon Valley are seeing a big reset, we're not seeing the same kind of reset in these rise of the rest city. So I think that that bodes well if we can continue, continue yeah, to yeah. make sure venture capital is is everywhere. One great statistic in the book is over the last decade, 1,400 new regional venture capital firms have started up out in these rise of the rest cities. So that really bodes well for this next chapter. I can't let you go without having some comment on Twitter going private and Elon Musk being at the helm of this. What's your view in how the view into entrepreneurs changes as it really becomes the mouthpiece, particularly even in a private way, the mouthpiece for individuals and politicians alike? Well, I'm a big fan of Twitter. It was one of the early, early users, and certainly think Elon's one of the most creative entrepreneurs we've we've, we've seen in this in this era. So, don't want to bet against him. I think he does have some challenges, a little bit like the the dog that caught, caught the car, and it's a little bit now what. And I know he wants to make some moves around making it more of a town square, but I think he'll need to be careful in terms of making sure he doesn't lose users, doesn't lose advertisers, doesn't trigger more more regulation. So, mm -hmm. so really, the first day of a, of a new day for for Twitter. I hope I hope it goes well. Steve, what should big tech do with a 10-year strategic plan? The massive cash buildup, selected companies with massive share buyback. They literally, it seems, don't have the imagination of what to do with a profit. Where should they be 10 years from now? Well, obviously, some of these companies have had enormous success over the last uh, decade, as, as you've said, and that gives them a lot of you know, flexibility. But I think the market is saying, including with, with, with Facebook, while you need to lean in the future, you need to invest in things like the metaverse, you need to do it in a, in a balanced way. I think you'll see more of that, more of the pressure uh, from Wall Street around companies in terms of their investment strategies. As I said earlier, right. that actually creates an opportunity for, <clears throat> for entrepreneurs who can be disruptive. It, it's been hard to disrupt and big tech in the last decade. It may get easier 
in the coming years. And quickly, Lisa, here, there's the fall of selected places, right. like the struggles of Chicago and San Francisco. Right. As you get sort of this diversification of sources of entrepreneurship, San Francisco in particular, very much front and focus, this just crossing, Paul Pelosi, the husband of uh, Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker, was violently assaulted early on Friday, early today, following a break-in at the couple's San Francisco home. Uh, this just coming <clears throat> out. Steve, do you think that San Francisco can recover from the exodus, the work-from-home trends, some of the feeling that it's been having for a while that it might be very much in the downtrend. Well, San Francisco is still a great city. Silicon Valley is still a great place. It will still be the leader of the pack. When we talk about the rise of the rest, we're not predicting the decline of, of, of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. We're just the rise of other, other cities. But I do think you're starting to see a dispersion of talent. The people who felt they had to be in Silicon Valley now feel they have flexibility in other places. Mm -hmm. Venture capitalists that were only investing in Silicon Valley now are investing in other places. And that's why I wrote this book, to inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs and the investors to back them in cities like Baltimore, Detroit, Minneapolis, yeah. Denver, Nashville, all over the country that are really emerging as great startup hubs. Folks, I'm not going to mince words. Bloomberg surveillance is about this nation. It's not just about New York City and maybe San Francisco and name some other things. Nobody has done more coast to coast than Steve Case on expansion of this nation and innovation and technology. 240 pages, the rise of the rest, Steve Case, uh, with an update on his work of the last uh, decade. Steve Case, thank you. Uh, Lisa, we've got to talk here Be with you. Uh, about this. I mean, this goes back to Lindsay Piegs at Chicago talking about the exodus of Chicago off the mic here recently. Here's another shock out of San Francisco. Well, and how much does this really speak to some of the main voter issues? Issues, which is crime, which is sort of the yep. quality of life, and how much can this really become a theme? And, and you know, you see Republicans trying to be out front on this. How do Democrats try to get the upper hand? It sort of is uh, interesting timing, especially now that we've got less than fewer than two weeks to the election, Tom. Yeah, it's, it's there, and it's perfect timing to have Steve Case on with us as he talks about some of these burgeoning uh, cities. We have a burgeoning market, futures at negative 19, the VIX. A good week for the VIX from that 30 level coming in 27 point one zero on the yields as john farrell mentions earlier up 12 basis points back up a four percent on the 10-year four point zero four percent this is bloomberg good morning